Hello and welcome to this meeting of the plan or the slightly delayed meeting of the Planning and Development Council of the Town of Oakville. Uh, we've had quite the uh, winter event over the last, uh, I guess, uh, more than 48 hours. And in fact, before we begin the meeting, I thought I would share with uh, the public the message I just got from our uh, winter control people. Uh, it's not that long, but it has uh, information about what's still to be done. Just under 48 hours ago, we were advised of a significant snow event, which proved to be slightly more than its prediction. We thank everyone for their support and their patience as crews have been working hard to dig out from this one. Our roads are in much better shape than they were 12 hours ago, and they're getting better as the minutes tick by. Crews will continue to work through the night tonight with a focused effort being placed on our primary and secondary sidewalk system. Progress will be slowed by the volume of snow that we need to manage, but we can say every effort will be made to clear them as soon as possible. For those with laneways within your ward, we can advise that laneway snow removal is actively underway and will take a few days to complete. Some patients will be required. Plows have now made their way through each laneway, making them traversable for our residents, but not fully cleared. On the weather front, we are tracking a small system coming in from the west that currently has some snow in its forecast up to two centimeters. There's the slight possibility of rain in the morning as the uh, temperature rises and then falls back below zero in the afternoon. Our team will continue to monitor the system and respond as necessary. Uh, thank you everybody for your interest in that. And now, uh, having called the meeting to order, um, I'll ask if there are any regrets. I know that Councillor Palmer is regrets, and I think I see everybody else here. Um, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Madam Clerk, uh, I see none. Uh, Council, we need uh, a mover and seconder to resolve in a committee of the whole, if you wish. Council Lischina and Councilor Longo, thank you. Any objection? There being none, that carries, and we're now in committee of the whole. The, the uh, chief uh, change from that is uh, uh, we only need a mover, we don't need a seconder. Uh, at this time, I'd like to announce that council has received a substitute recommendation for item number 7.3. And I note that uh, our attendees tonight all seem to be interested in that topic. And so I will ask uh, uh, the clerk, are, are you able to post that on the overhead at this point? I'll read it when we post it. We're waiting for a printout. I'm just putting it in the podium user. Oh. But in any event, it'll be up momentarily, correct? Yes, okay. All right. Okay. Well, now you very likely can read it for yourself, but I, if, if I can see the display, Madam Clerk, I will read it at um, a slow pace, and that way, uh, hopefully, everyone can be up to date. The, re the new recommendation is similar to the old one, but there, there are some significant differences. There is a significant difference. One, that the report be received. Two, that council endorses the criticisms of the Halton draft preferred growth concept. Three, that this motion and the town staff report be submitted to Halton region as part of the uh, regional official plan review. And four, 
that this motion and the report be forwarded for information to Burlington, Halton Hills, Milton, Credit Valley Conservation, Grand River Conservation, and Conservation Halton. All of those agencies have uh, some say in our affairs in Halton because Halton embraces all of those watersheds rather than only the Halton uh, watershed. Uh, Madam Clerk, I think you could take that down now. Thank you. Um, Council, I'd like to ask if you um, regard the consent items as routine enough to give me a motion, not only for them, but also for the heritage minutes. Councillor Duddock, thank you. Any objection to the motion for the consent and heritage items? Madam Clerk, there being none, those are adopted. Now we have um, a couple of public hearing items to deal with. And uh, the, uh, the first one is the, uh, let me see. I've got to get to the right page. I'm looking for it. I confused myself when I shuffled my papers. Page, which page? Oh, page four. Here we go. I've caught up. So we have one public hearing item, and this is a um, uh, public hearing report for MGM development at 627 Lyons Lane. We have a presentation from Trish Collingwood, our senior planner, and correspondence was submitted and distributed to council. And if anyone is watching the live stream of this meeting and you wish to speak to this item, you can call 905-815-6095 to be connected to the meeting. You would be called to speak upon following the registered delegations, of which there are none. Uh, and and uh, at this time, I'll give the Zoom to, to uh, Trish Collingwood to summarize for the public the matter that uh, Council has already read uh, an extensive file on. Ms. Collingwood? Thank you, Mayor Burton and members of council. <clears throat> the purpose of this report is to present the zoning bylaw amendment application submitted by MGM development in, con in conjunction with the required statutory public meeting. As noted by my report, there are no decisions to be made tonight. Um, and at this time, the staff report is to be received by council. The applicant is proposing a 26 story building that would require a section 37 agreement to permit the additional height requested. And they did hold a public information meeting uh, in February of 2020 where no members of the public attended, um, attended that meeting. Tonight, if you wish to call to speak to this item, you can call 905-815-6095. Next slide, please. So the subject lands are located um, sort of in the center of the slide uh, within the Midtown Growth Area, um, which is designated an urban growth center by the province. The property is approximately 800 meters, so about a 10 minute walk to the Oakville Go Station, which is considered a major transit station area within this designated settlement area. The subject property has a lot area of approximately 0 0.5 hectares and is located on the north side of Lyons Lane and the south side of Sur so the South Service Road. The property has 56 meters of frontage on Lyons Lane and about 93 meters of frontage on the South Service Road. There is an existing four story office building on the site, which is proposed to be demolished as part of this development. Surrounding land uses include um, the self service road and the QEW to the north, um, to the east, future high density residential development at, at 599 Lions Lane, um, which is the vacant site um, shown just to the east, as well as the Home Depot site. Um, to the south is Lions Lane and 16 Mile Creek, and to the west is the town of Oakville Community Gardens. Next slide, please. This is the urban structure schedule from Livable Oakville. Um, and it provides the basic structural elements of nodes and corridors where higher density forms of growth are to be accommodated. 
uh, I have identified the site with a red star um, within the Midtown growth area. And this site is within close proximity to a regional transit node, um, a, a provincial priority transit corridor, um, and regional transit nodes are located at key locations to integrate with the townwide transportation system and to provide a focus for transit supportive development. Next slide, please. So in Livable Oakville, the site is designated high density residential on schedule L1. Um, and the policies within um, Livable Oakville permit this type of residential uh, built form and state that the residential high density have a density range of up to 185 units per site hectare. Next slide, please. The proposed height, um, which is 26 stories, exceeds the height permissions in the residential high um, land use category, uh, which is 20 stories. So the applicant is proposing to enter into a section 37 agreement, which I'll discuss a little bit later in the presentation um, to, to, um, to, for an exchange of bonusing for the additional six stories in height. Next slide, please. The subject lands are currently, exone, are currently zoned existing development. Um, the current zoning requires a rezone. So the current zoning obviously requires a rezoning to, um, to implement the official plan and to bring in the residential high uh, land use um, zone. Um, and so that, that would then implement the goals, objectives, and policies of Livable Oakville plan, including um, permitting the taller residential apartment dwelling on the site. The applicant pros, proposes to rezone the property to residential high with special provisions um, and modifications that would include minimum and maximum yard flexibility, maximum height permissions um, for the podium and towers, including bonusing, um, looking at uh, the height of the rooftop mechanical equipment, um, regulating the number of dwelling units if, if needed, and um, looking at an appropriate parking ratio that would accommodate both the, uh, residential uses and visitors. Next slide, please. So this is the site plan that was submitted. The applicant um, has submitted the zoning bylaw amendment application to permit the development of the 26 story residential building. Uh, the buildings were proposed right now to accommodate 295 residential units with 295 parking spaces, and that's inclusive of visitor parking within an underground parking garage. Uh, the development also pro uh, proposes um, to accommodate 295 bicycle parking spaces and vehicular access is looked at on for coming from South Service Road. Um, part of that is because the town is looking at, that we are currently reviewing the um, future public roadway function of Lions Lane. So drawing from recommendations um, of the Midtown Oakville Transportation and Stormwater Class Environmental Assessment back in 2014, we did look at the future of the local road system in Midtown and whether or not there was going to be a need to realign Lions Lane in the future. Um, based on uh, development interest in 599 Lions Lane and a previous um, Ontario Municipal Board decision on that site, um, we have been looking at what that realignment looks like and whether or not um, Lions Lane will stay in its future form. So last year, the town uh, commissioned a geotechnical review of Lions Lane, of, sorry, of, of the, the valley, the slope, um, the stable top of bank and what it meant for Lions Lane. And uh, based on that, we are looking a little bit more at um, the realignment of Lions Lane to allow maybe for the closure of that road potentially and uh, a realignment of it slightly east. And that is still being looked at um, with regards to, uh, in conjunction with the planning department and the engineering department um, and uh, future discussion will be coming through this application and uh, others in the area. Next slide, please. So this is a proposed elevation um, looking east along QEW, so southeast um, looking from the QEW. And this is 
the 26 story building. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. This is looking at, um, at it uh, from the south side from the ravine and uh, towards the north of looking at the site with five nine lions sort of ghosted in um, to kind of get a picture of what both of those applications could, um, could look like in the future if they both move forward. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that the applicant is looking to bonus um, height above 20 stories. They are looking at an additional six stories. Um, the, so in, in Livable Oakville, we have bonusing policies that permit uh, increases in height in exchange for public benefits that are identified in the plan. Um, so we do have we do have general bonusing policies for all um, growth areas that are that are eligible for bonusing. However, specifically in Midtown, we do have some more specific public benefits, and that includes a grade separated or any grade separated pedestrian and cycling facilities across the QEW railway tracks or Trafalgar Road for. Example, um, the Midtown EA did look at uh, a crossing and the abutment is actually within the QEW now that was built by the MTO for uh, pedestrian cycling facilities from Oakville Mall into Midtown. Um, also community, community facilities such as a creative center, including studio, office, uh, exhibition, performance and retail space, um, as well as a library. Um, another item is improved local transit facilities and transit user amenities. Uh, also looking at parkland improvements beyond the minimum standards for public squares and plazas, as well as public arts. So these are all items that are specifically included in the Midtown, um, Midtown growth area policies in Livable Oakville that we will be discussing with the applicant. Next slide, please. So matters to be considered that have been identified um, up to this point, uh, we're still receiving comments from departments and agencies uh, on, the, um, on the site, but these have been identified to this point, um, looking at provincial and regional policies, uh, including uh, servicing capacity in the area, um, support for the Metrolinx's uh, regional transit plan up to 2041 for the future rail improvements along the Lakeshore line, Conformity with livable Oakville policies, uh, Midtown Oakville intensification objectives, bonusing exchange for increased height, as I just mentioned, livable by design guidelines, parts A and C. And I will say this applicant has met with our urban design team several times over the last year to uh, really shape the, the look of the, um, the building to date. So we have had a lot of good progress on, um, uh, on that front. Um, impacts of future development on the redevelopment of adjacent sites. Um, and I spoke earlier about the, the development um, on re 599 Lions Lane and then future, future redevelopment of the Home Depot sites. Long-term stability of the existing alignment of Lions Lane, which I spoke to about a couple minutes ago. The contribution to the transit supportive environment in the envisioned public realm of the major transit, transit station area. Uh, overall justification for the proposed zoning amendment to implement the official plan, assessment of transportation impacts to the existing road network, uh, appropriate parking standards, um, the inclusion of tra travel demand measure management measures, and alignment with the climate emergency declared by Council in June 2019. Next slide, please. So with that, uh, the recommendation um, from a staff report um, going forward is that the public meeting report prepared by the Planning Services Department dated January 4th, 2022 be received and that comments from the public with respect to the zoning bylaw amendment application submitted by MGM development be received and that staff consider such comments as may be provided by council. Thank you, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. We have at least three councillors with comments for you, and, and I have a couple. Uh, Councillor Giddings. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hollywood, for the presentation. A couple of questions. You talked about bonusing, uh, going from 20 stories to 26. Is there anything in between, depending on what they come back with in discussions? Could it be a 24, 
story or 25 story? For you, Mr. Mayor, um, yes, that uh, that is definitely a possibility. So they are requesting what they would like to get um, through the review of the transportation study and um, shadowing, uh, you know, just impact to the area um, and uh, the the geotechnical requirements as well, pushing potentially pushing the development footprint north, as well as we're now looking at the MTO requirement setbacks um, that come, you know, come push the development south. Uh, all those impacts will will change the application going forward, and we will in in doing so we will be looking at the uh, height of the building and if 26 stories is appropriate. So it could land somewhere in between 20 and 26. We're just not at that point right now where we have a definitive answer. All right, and you mentioned the uh, possible walkway over to, to finish off the little crutch that's in the middle of the QBW there. Um, it would be things like that or the library. It doesn't touch on any of the vehicular flyovers or anything that would normally be covered under development charges. That's correct, three, Mr. Mayor, that is correct. Um, so we are looking at items that would not fall under the DCs that were not, uh, the town isn't able to capture in another way um, uh, for growth, paying for growth. And so one of those items that uh, pops out in my mind is, is the abutment in the middle of the QEW that was put in, I can't even remember, I wanna say 10 years ago, um, maybe more actually. And uh, you know that has, has been identified as a, um, a great opportunity for the community to allow pedestrians to get over the QEW without walking along the sidewalk uh, along Trafalgar Road. So that is definitely a uh, project top of mind, I think that uh, could be considered for any type of midtown bonusing. All right, the, so you explained the process. Do they come to us with lists and deep, or do you have a shopping list? Like what's the process on that? So the process for bonusing, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a, a large uh, process that we go through, but uh, we first, they first apply. Um, they submit their zone, rezoning application because the bonusing has to be included in the bylaw. So we have to say that we, you know, we've permitted bonusing in the zoning in order to implement the OPA policies that say bonusing for the site is eligible. So that's the first thing they've, they've checked that box. Um, second, we start having discussions typically after the public meeting, which is now. Um, I'd like to start having some discussions with the applicant on items that they consider um, worthy of bonusing from their site. And, um, and we, you know, we have our items that we hold deep, near and dear from the livable Oakville plant. So we start having those discussions um, with regards to what, what the site merits, um, what that site really, what, what really could come from the development here to bring, for, uh, bring forward as community benefit. Um, you know, the site really has to benefit the public in some way and what can we get in Midtown that, you know, will truly do that. Um, and so we, we start having those discussions around about the same time what they what I ask from them is a before and after scenario that talks about what before bonusing looks like with units GFA and height and after they give that to us. Um, we, we sit down and we discuss it with our manager of realty services and we um, we then have a little sit down meeting with them to talk about having an appraisal done on the site. That, that, that gives us um, a bit more of a dollar amount that looks at the delta of that difference from before and after. Um, we take that delta uh, difference and we apply um, a percentage of, of that delta towards, um, towards what we think is a fair um, evaluation of the bonusing opportunity in Midtown. Uh, that is the process that we go forward with. We, we take it forward. We ask the counselors, um, such as yourself, we will ask you like what, what your interests are, because now we have potentially the delta amount, or sorry, the, the variable amount that we will look at, and we ask um, for potential projects um, within our criteria uh, of interest. And um, we, depending on what happens at the recommendation meeting, uh, we will we inform council of uh, where we're going with the negotiations um, for bonusing. And then at that time, we sit down, we negotiate the final sort of uptake 
and um, and all of that is kind of prefaced with we're still doing a review of what the height should be. So we do have to kind of take into consideration that we might not be fully done our review and uh, it's an iterative process as we go forward. I appreciate the detail. Um, also in terms of the process under matters to be considered, um, I just need a little clarification. Uh, one of the matters to be considered is the establishment of an appropriate parking standard for residential, including visitor parking. And in the proposal, they're talking 295 parking spaces. So that's where you have to look at uh, the building as well as the policy direction that will be in the area at, uh, concurrently. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, correct. Um, we do have to look at that. We do have to look at, you know, when it comes to parking in this area, in Midtown area, um, we do need to look at what balances the this transit station area, what, what supports transit um, development and improvements along the Lakeshore line, uh, pedestrian walkability. And um, we, we would look at whether or not their uh, parking proposed rate of one, one space per unit, and that includes visitor so you could say 0.8 spaces per unit for the residential and 0.2 for visitor is sort of what they're coming forward with um, looking at whether or not that is appropriate and one thing we do is we look to their transportation study to see if they've used um, how they've justified that rate if we're not satisfied we will ask them to provide a parking just a deeper park parking justification study that looks at precedent sites and other growth areas and major transit station areas all right, um, I see the lineup of hands. I, I'll just limit my uh, to one more at this time. Uh, you talk about 599 and 627 in terms of how they develop to get, uh, together, how uh, 627 shouldn't have any negative effects uh, on 599. 599 you mentioned was, was approved through an OMB hearing 11, 12 years ago, I believe. Um, so what do we do with contextually appropriate in terms of um, shadowing uh, we're already an approved building? If you could just touch on that. Good, great question through you, Mr. Mayor. We are looking, we do have, um, we do have a bit of a conceptual site plan in from 599 Lions. Uh, we do through our modeling work that some of our staff do, we can kind of plug in uh, the footprints into our model to take a look at um, the shadowing impacts from 627 and vice versa, 599. We do know that 599 is looking at 26 stories, um, two towers. So we do have some context to be able to evaluate and model based on that. Um, we do, we, we do want to look at separation distances, massing, um, and, uh, and any sort of negative impacts that may come from, uh, access, uh, vehicular access. Um, we are looking at, um, possibilities with, uh, sorry, with regards to if, if line lane, lines lane needs to be shifted, what does access look like? for 599 Lions Lane. Uh, so we are, this is a tough one. It's a complicated, we are working with both applicants at the same time. We've had several meetings over the last year and a bit with both applicants. Um, even just as much as last week, we met with both to talk about access in Lions Lane and continue that discussion to make sure that, um, that we're moving forward most appropriately with uh, as, as you know, as, as compatible developments as possible. And part of that is looking at, they, they are looking at similar heights and similar type towers with podiums and skinny towers. I appreciate the complexity and the road network should be penciled in prior to construction here. Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, we are, um, we are taking steps. So the town has taken, you know, a lot of, has done a lot of work with getting the geotech done, uh, working with agencies to make sure that it's been reviewed by conservation halts and in the region, because we do have servicing from both the region as well as ourselves under Lions Lane. So, um, and then obviously conservation Halton is very interested in the study. So we have taken a lot of efforts to get that study done. And now, 
um, through some work that the engineering department has um, asked a consulting firm to do to look at the, the alignment of Lions Lane, we are looking at what our options are um, for the, the shifting of that road. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Giddings. As you know, uh, staff will be happy to receive further questions and suggestions from you by email if uh, you've left any out tonight. Councillor Chisholm. Thank you, Worship. Tricia, uh, thank you very much for the report. The only, mine's more, more of a minor nature is with respect to the, uh, the community garden plots in that location. And also we got the Catholic uh, uh, Cemetery. What is, is there gonna be any, as part of the considerations uh, to be reviewed, uh, looking at that, at that, those areas, if uh, we have to move um, the garden plots out uh, into another area or we maintain it and have it secured. Uh, is that taken into consideration with respect to the, and also the shadowing uh, with a large tall building with respect to uh, our growth of, you know, we're trying to have, uh, you know, secure security in our food and our food. Uh, and this is creating, it might create a problem. So it just, just want to make sure that that is part of our discussions with the, uh, the developer in, in the process. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, those are all great points, and they are all are they all are all on our list of things for review. So the community gardens and the shadowing is a big question. Uh, we are taking a look at that, and I do have um, a point in my file to uh, sit down with Parks Department to talk about the future of that space and what it looks like. Thank you, Tricia. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Chisholm. Councillor Hazlitt Teal. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Thank you, Ms. Collingwood, for the, uh, the details. And uh, Councillor Giddings got lots of what I um, also had as questions. You mentioned the regulation of, of, of the number of apartment units. Can we, uh, or has the applicant given us the mix of units that they will provide? Um, yes. Uh, the, so, I just want to, I want to clarify this for uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. I do want to clarify a uh, mix of units. So through rezoning to the start of a site plan or even through a site plan application, we often see shifts and market changes, um, you know, to, uh, from some of your experience on 70 old mill. We're seeing a, a, sh a real shift there from larger units to smaller family, or sorry, smaller units. So moving from family size units to smaller units on that site based on marketing. Um, so I just want to, I just want to couch this sort of with saying that the units that they're proposing now, 295 um, units, it may not be what they come forward with regards to with when they do come forward um, for site plan. So there may be some sh shifts in that way. Um, I have reached out and asked them about uh, units and we are going to sit down and have a little talk about what type of units. It is something with regards to Midtown, the policy group and ourselves, when we're meeting with applicants looking at sites in Midtown, we are talking to them about um, mix of unit sizes. So some three bedrooms, some family units, uh, making sure no matter what they're applying for now, we're, we're sort of pushing that envelope. Um, market-based rental units, uh, affordable units. Um, so we, we do need to have uh, a discussion with the applicant on sort of where they see this going, but it's early stages yet. And uh, basically what we might want to do is look at, um, you know, more focusing on how, continuing those conversations through this and so that they know where we're sitting with regards to the type of units we do want to see. Um, and uh, moving that to, so that they can program in the site plan application. Okay, so um, I take that as when we get to a final recommendation, we will see, uh, we will see what uh, that mix would be, or will we still see that evolution at site plan and therefore the public may not really understand what the mix of units are. I think, I mean, we've got a we've got a rough estimate of um, upwards of close to sixty percent of one bedrooms, uh, thirty percent of two bedrooms, and ten percent of three bedrooms. Right now, is what you know it, is what sort of their look their proposal includes. Um, I just I want to be careful because I think that that could change. I don't want to like hold on to those numbers too firmly. Um, I think that that could potentially change. We're seeing a lot of changes through, throughout COVID on the types of units that are coming forward and where what people are looking for. Um, 
I don't know, and I haven't I haven't sat down with our policy group um, or the region's housing group on this application to see if this is a good mix for this site. Um, but but that is something we still need to do before the recommendation meeting. Well, for the record, I think that mix is off kilter, um, and it would um, we should definitely be encouraging them to the two and and uh, family style. Um, it, it may not be the dominant theme, but um, those seem rather low con con uh, considering what we're faced with um, and that uh, families do need to be able to live uh, and enjoy um, living in that that form of uh, built form. So um, I'm glad that you're going to continue to have those discussions. Um, further to Councillor Giddings questions on the bonusing and um, different options. Um, we've been asked by um, several residents uh, about um, how they can have a stronger voice and how those community benefits are um, determined. So it's it's a good list, but how can they give you um, uh, maybe their perspective around um, they want to see more on the parkland side or they're very seriously concerned about um, you know the uh, the act of transportation, which is already on there, but how do they, is it directly to you? Is it just through us? Um, because they are worried that that it, the broader perspective, um, they they want to have a stronger voice in. For you, Mr. Mayor, I would uh, I would encourage um, people that are reaching out to yourself. Uh, I encourage them when they re reach out to me uh, if they have thoughts on community benefits or what you know what is lacking or what could be improved in their area to to include that in their comments. So I would, I, you know, emails, phone calls to myself, to yourselves uh, that, that talk about what those kind of benefits they see could be. It's, it's the same as any comment for, on a file. It's, it's always welcomed and uh, it's, it's helpful to understand what people in that area see as needed. Um, so I would uh, encourage that to continue. And then through the community benefit charge process that's coming uh, that will that will take over from bonusing. I believe um, through that process, there is in, in um, developing that process for Oakville, I believe there's going to be a community um, community input uh, opportunity. So thank you for that. My, my final question is, can you just clarify the status of 599? Because uh, it, it, my understanding is it was approved by the OMB, but on hold. So is it is its hold, um, uh, does it remain in place and, and is 627 now ahead of them in the queue in order to develop? Because the, your report indicates that um, the allocation is there um, for water, uh, et cetera. So where, where, what is fi 599 status relative to 627? Hey, Mr. Mayor, I just want to say one thing that so in talking with the region in the last couple of weeks, we are still assessing the capacity from what water and wastewater for this site. Mm -hmm. So those comments are still coming in. Um, it's uh, so, you know, I'll wait for formal comments to from the region, but we are still taking a look at that. With regards to your question on um, who's who's where on, the, on this. So 599 has zoning. They do have their zoning. It's just not in effect because they have holds on, on their, that they do need to remove in order to bring in a site plan. So their zoning is there. Uh, they need to, they have submitted an application. They did in 2020, an application to remove the holds. Uh, the holds are extensive. So the holds include a design um, and construction drawings of uh, lines of the realignment of Lions Lane it involves land conveyances, um, as well as um, a bonusing agreement. So there's quite a bit of there's a quite a bit there's quite a bit to the holds that need to be lifted for 599 Lions Lane. And now that we are looking at um, what the future function of the roadway is, those discussions are ongoing with them. Um, so I can't predict how quickly they will move through that process. Uh, the geotech study did show quite a shift of their development footprint um, uh, inwards into the site. Uh, so we are we have been meeting with them in the last couple of weeks with regards to what does that mean for their development footprint and uh, and the conceptual site plan that they had in front of us. So those discussions are ongoing. Should um, 
627 get their zoning approval in the next six months, they would be at a point to go to site plan if there were no holds placed on the bylaw with regards to servicing. Um, I haven't received any other comments that would lean me that would um, lead me to think there's going to be other holds placed on the site. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if we need to take a look at the servicing uh, aspect through a hold. Okay, and I'm appreciative of the comprehensive list you have of issues to be considered includes um, its contextual appropriateness um, between the three buildings. So thank you for a comprehensive report. Thank you, Councillor Hazlitt Thiel. Councillor O'Meara. Uh, thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, thank you, Tricia. Uh, am I correct in, in understanding that this building will be built before our um, Midtown Road Network will be constructed? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I wouldn't be able to predict that at this time. Uh, if you mean the entire Midtown Road Network, uh, the chances are a good one. Um, I think there's a few projects, Cross Avenue realignment, re or sorry, the Cross Avenue um, detailed design is to begin either this year or next year. Uh, so there is still um, a lot of work to be done. Uh, with regards to the local road network on the west side of Trafalgar, that is development driven. So we would need to see more developments coming forward that impact the local road network where we could get more conveyances of, the, of uh, that road network. Um, those all kind of have their own timelines and will play out as, as they will. And uh, it should 627 proceed on a, you know, in the next year or two, then, then yes, they will move ahead of uh, several projects. Uh, so then, and is it also, am I also seeing it right that the only public roadway then to access this development will be on the South Service Road? Is that the only public roadway that they'll ac access the site from? At, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, there has been no conclusion on what's happening with Lions Lane at this time or with regards to timing, if, if should the road uh, be realigned regards to timing of that. So I, I, couldn't, I can't comment on, on the timing for Lions Lane. Um, so service road, the transportation uh, impact analysis study that they submitted uh, for to support this application is looking at all of their traffic um, in ingress, egress and um, exiting onto South Service Road and then use functioning or funneling through the rest of uh, Midtown. So we will be looking at the impacts of that. Yeah, and I guess that's where I'm going with this. I'm, I'm, I'm having mild panic attacks thinking about all of these vehicles cut through all these private properties, whether it's the Home Depot driveway, whether it's the Holiday Inn driveway, whether it's all of these private roads to get down to Cross Avenue um, and the battles that will ensue once that starts happening. So perhaps we can take a, a good look at that in, in terms of what, what can be done to mitigate that in the short term. Uh, and, and perhaps, um, you know, if there's some other westerly connection in the future that will be connected so that people don't always have to drive to Trafalgar Road in order to get into our road system because you know that they're going to try and look for another way so I'm, I just thought I'd, I'd flag that if we can look into that that would probably save a lot of headaches moving on in the future. Through you Mr. Merritt uh, acknowledged and noted. Yep. Thank you uh, Councillor O'Meara. Councillor Adams. Councillor Adams, you get the, the uh, first, you're muted uh, advice of the night. Oh my, I took the, I, I lowered the hand, but didn't unmute. How embarrassing. <laughs> all right, well, let that be a lesson to all of you. Um, I think I've got four questions and some sub questions or comments. Uh, the first is, can you confirm the density that's expected on the site and how that compares to the targets for Midtown? Uh, particularly if there's changes to the number of bedrooms per unit? Yes, let me just take a quick look here. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Excuse me, sorry, I thought I thought I had the density in front of me and I do not, I, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councillor Adams, I'm going to have to get 
back to you on the exact number. Excuse me, um, uh, Ms. Ms. Collingwood. Council, this is the meeting. This is not the recommendation report. This is where you, you lodge your issues uh, for staff to address in the recommendation report. So rather than asking for these answers at this point, maybe it would be more efficient of everybody's time if you said that you'd like this particular issue examined and reported in the recommendation report. Would that yes, so would in, that help? So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Burton. So in absence of the answer being readily available, uh, then I would ask uh, if staff could report on um, how the density of the project supports our targets for Midtown, um, recognizing the, the need to be able to provide um, high, higher densities within the Midtown area, uh, and whether it's done through um, taller buildings or wider footprints or, or larger unit sizes. I'm not sure which, but in any case. And through um, you, Mr. Mayor, the, I believe the um, the correct number is 100. It's about 148 units per site hectare, which comes below our 185 units per site hectare, which is the cap in this area. Sorry, could you say that again, please? I believe the units per site hectare is 148. Okay. As as per the unit count right now, um, which is slightly lower than the 185 units per site hectare cap. So compared area. to the cap, and how does and so if you could, um, ag again, re return with a review of how that supports the density in terms of the population targets, um, the the two hundred um, uh, people per hectare uh, kind of figure that has been out there, for example, um, and recognizing that these are the kinds of sites that could support those kind of things. Uh, the second area. Um, uh, I, I guess is more of a, um, a follow up on the bonusing discussion that happened earlier uh, to ask if you can continue to review the issue of the pedestrian cycling crossings uh, of both the creek and the QEW. I think those are, in my opinion, those are good um, uses of bonusing funds that might be available. Um, uh, I think it would help with the entire community. Uh, the third question is, uh, can you report on whether the MTO has any comments on proposals that are near the highway, um, whether they be for issues associated with either wind or issues with um, shadowing or any other uh, comments that they might have uh, or noise uh, concerns that might be brought forward. And then the last one is, can you report back on uh, the issue or the concept of splitting the parking spots from the ownership of the unit, assuming this is not a rental building, I'm assuming this is intended to be a condo ownership. Um, can you can you comment on whether uh, the parking spots can be separated from the units themselves? Or, sh or should they be? Through you, Mr. Mayor, so I haven't had those discussions with the applicant yet on the parking spots. Uh, MTO is commenting on the development and we do have some comments in already. Um, from their perspective, we are looking at the wind cl and climate um, studies for this development and, uh, and I agree, uh, the pedestrian cycling crossings will be included in the bonusing discussions. Great, thanks, that's everything I had. Thank you, Councillor Adams. I wonder if one of you would like to move that the report be received and the comments from the public and council uh, be received. I saw a hand, Councillor Hazlitt Thiel, thank you very much. Any objection? There... Oh, yeah. Uh, and Mr. Charles will read off the additional issues you added to the uh, recommendation. Hopefully Mr. Charles has kept a sharp pencil busy over there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the additional, or the comments that we'd heard, which were in addition to the staff report, uh, was looking at the establishment of an appropriate parking standard inclusive of visitor spaces, a need to consider the overall mix of uses, or sorry, of dwelling unit sizes, I apologize, uh, what we can do to mitigate cut through traffic and accelerate the implementation of the Midtown Road Network, Report back on the density of the project and how it implements the growth targets for Midtown. 
look at bonusing and opportunities for crossings of the QEW and the 16 Mile Creek Valley, report back on MTO's comments on the proposal, and investigate whether we can uncouple the parking spaces from the dwelling units. Your Worship. Sorry, you, you have your hand up and I'm trying to check if you have an issue to add or if you're objecting to the motion. Not objecting, just to, just to reiterate with respect when I was talking to Tricia about the impact of the, um, the community garden plots in that area and the impact of the, uh, the cemetery as part of the uh, discussions. I know it's a minor thing, but I don't want to lose Lose that sight of that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I took Ms. Collingwood to assure you that uh, shadowing is already a, an issue and that they consider all aspects, but I, I'm confident that Mr. Charles has just added the community garden and shadows as an extra precise element for you. All right. Now, and he, he signifies that he has. Um, any objection to our final crafted motion? One, two, three, Madam Clerk. Uh, there was no objection and the motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Now, Council, we have two discussion items. And uh, and I and we have, depending on people's use of time, I would estimate close to three hours worth of delegations on item 7.3. Uh, what you have for discussion items are the recommendation reports for Randall Oakville Developments Limited and, uh, and then after that, the town initiated, initiated omnibus zoning bylaw amendment to the North Oakville zoning bylaw. We have a presentation available from the planners for each and no registered delegations. In the, uh, in the case of the first one, uh, a representative for Randall Oakville Developments is available if you have questions. And uh, I'm in your hands. I need to know what you would like. Do you want the presentation on 7.1? Councillor Adams. I'm happy to move ahead without the presentation. Ooh. Right, well, it's a it, it's a long studied and much read file here. Uh, Councillor Chisholm, do you have a view? Yes, I think I'd like to have the presentation uh, on the basis this is a major uh, change or impact in the downtown and with, with heights and uh, setbacks and streetscaping. I think we all need to have a refreshment on it. I know we've read the reports, but I think we need to uh, just have a brief um, um, report on, on this. That's my personal opinion on it. Well, uh, to bring everybody in line. I'm happy to accommodate you. Ms. Collingwood is um, uh, warmed up and ready. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Um, okay, my staff report is found as item 6.1 on your agenda tonight. Uh, this report recommends the approval of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment application submitted by Randall Oakville and Church Oakville Developments Limited to permit the development of a 12 story mixed use building with some ground floor commercial and retail space as well as office space on the second and third floor. Um, and this site is 150 Randall, 125 Navy, and 143 Church Street. If you would like to speak to this item, please call 905-815-6095. Next slide, please. So the development consists of three individual parcels. Um, the subject properties have a combined lot area of approximately 0, 3, uh, 0 through 4 hectares and located at the southeast corner of Randall and Navy Street. Um, I'll just quickly go through the site, uh, the surrounding site. So there is a 12 story building to the north on the north side of Randall. Um, there's the 156 Randall Street to the east, uh, the new development that incorporated the Heritage Building at the corner of uh, Thomas and Randall Street. It's a four-story building, and I believe the Heritage Unit is occupied and the rest of the building is near final completion. 
to the south is Church Street and the Community Living Building, as well as commercial uses on the south side of Church. And to the west is Navy Street and the Oakville Performing Arts Center, Centennial Pool, uh, Oakville Galleries and the Library. Next slide, please. Uh, through the approval um, of OP official plan amendment 20, the central business district designation, which was formerly across the site was replaced with mixed use designations, including urban core. Uh, the building height for the urban core land use designation is eight to 12 stories. And um, it, it therefore increased the development potential on this site um, from four stories to 12. Next slide. The urban structure schedule is shown here. I've highlighted the downtown area and put a star on um, a, approximately where the site is located. Uh, again, the urban structure is, is here to help us look at where sites for intensification are most appropriate, which and where density increases are consistent with the growth plan and uh, the PPS. The subject lands are within um, the downtown Oakville growth area. Next slide, please. So this is the site proposed site plan. And at the top of the slide is Randall Street. Um, and the green arrow indicates where the proposed vehicle entrance and exit would be um, for, the for the underground garage. And um, there is a laneway that um, comes, comes from the sort of rear of the site and accesses uh, Church Street and originally there was proposed um, vehicular access, potential emergency access, that kind of thing proposed for the site. Um, and I will talk about that later, but I've shown red dashed lines that that will not be permitted, um, regular vehicular access from Church Street. Uh, the yellow and um, blue arrow indicate pedestrian um, accesses for the residential as well as for the um, office uses. And then the commercial uses along the ground floor will have their individual access and entrance points off of, um, off of the street. Next slide, please. So I'll go through these uh, fairly quickly. Um, this is a view of, uh, of the proposed building um, from Randall and Navy. Next slide. This is another view, uh, and this is from uh, Randall. The, it's an elevation along Randall Street. Um, you can see the, so you can see 156 um, Randall Street just to the left. And uh, that's the four story building I was just referring to a couple minutes ago. Next slide, please. This is a view of the proposal from Randall and Navy uh, intersection. It shows the proposed active uses along the ground floor, as well as some of the step backs and massing that's focused at this intersection. I'll speak to that in a minute as well. Next slide, please. Uh, a view of the Navy and church elevation. Um, you can see above the sixth story, the building begins to step back and that is to, um, to provide some relief for the Church Street uh, adjacent properties along Church Street and Thomas Street. And next slide, please. This is a view of the Navy uh, streetscape uh, showing the furnishing and landscape zone, um, the sidewalk and patio and market area that spills out from the building. Uh, it also shows how the first two floors are stepped back um, from the uh, property line uh, from the sidewalk to allow for a greater um, use of the public realm. And it also shows how starting at the fourth story, the uh, or the third story, sorry, the building is overhung slightly. Next slide, please. So this application was um, in front of the Heritage Advisory Committee for feedback um, because it does abut the Heritage, uh, the downtown um, Oakville Heritage Conservation District. So I, I just want to run through some of the comments that came, some of the feedback that came from the committee that uh, we did look at and will be looking at again through uh, the site plan application when that comes in. So first, I wanted to talk about the step backs, uh, step backs in the proposed building facing the Heritage District. So along Thomas Street, um, you can see how the building, the massing is more uh, geared towards Navy Street. Um, the building does step down and uh, step back towards 
towards the adjacent buildings along Thomas Street to reduce the shadowing impacts and any negative overlook um, concerns that uh, uh, in the massing, if the if the uh, twelve stories had been more geared towards that um, that yard uh, on the proposal. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the other comments that came from uh, the Heritage Committee included um, they they were uh, they were pleased with the neutral palette because it, they felt that it didn't that meant it, the design didn't detract, um, detract from the heritage properties in the area. Uh, they liked that the first second floor exterior treatment um, in relation to the streetscape that there was uh, quite a bit of public realm space that the building sat back that there was quite a bit of glazing they were uh, curious they were interested to see if through the site plan we could look at even more glazing or how that glazing was broken up on the first story um, first yeah sorry the first story as it as it hits the public realm and uh, they were they did have some concerns about the massing impacts of of um, the building uh, at the corner of or sorry Trafalgar, of uh, Navy and Randall and so we will be taking another look at the the massing impacts through the site plan um, and I will speak to it a little bit more when I talk about what the bylaw includes um, to take a look at that and they they did make comments and uh, were pleased with the uh, setbacks. Um, setbacks along all the frontages. So all of these items have um, or will be addressed by either the zoning bylaw or the urban design requirements that were included as part of this package and implemented through the site plan application. Next slide, please. So in addition to comments raised by staff at the statutory uh, public meeting, and uh, members of, plan of the Planning and Development Council um, and approved through the resolution at that stat meeting and um, comments that were received uh, internally. We, we did look at uh, each matter that I had brought forward in my public staff meeting, or public statutory uh, review. And I don't wanna go through all of them because I did comprehensively speak to each of these in my staff report, but I did just wanna talk about three of these here um, just to, to kind of hit a few highlights. So uh, how, one of the questions from the staff meeting was how many more residents or units can be accommodated in the downtown based on official plan amendment 20. So in 2016, a study of the unit council in downtown um, approximated that 1,468 new units could be accommodated in the downtown. Uh, through and through the upcoming official plan review of downtown Oakville, the number of units approved um, during the last five years will be incorporated into that population projection, and uh, we will be looking at what um, what the new projections are, what what the uh, what downtown can accommodate from here on in. That work hasn't been done yet, so we'll be looking for that in the next uh, year or so. Uh, the second item is report back on the proposed sidewalk widths and adequacy of the sidewalk in this location. So th through the future site plan application review, the applicant will be required to implement the recommendations of the downtown transportation and streetscaping study that was completed in 2015. Um, and this is with regards to sidewalk dimensions uh, in the tree and furnishing zones. Um, the applicant has proposed to push the building back from the property line along Randall Street, Navy Street, and Ch Church Street already, and we have reflected some of those setbacks and yards within the bylaw that I'll speak to in a couple minutes, but they are looking at set pushing back a minimum of three meters to allow for a more extensive uh, public realm. And the next one, uh, what would the cost be to the town with respect to road improvements as a result of this proposal? The transportation impact study completed by um, the applicant's consultant uh, that supported the application concluded that the new vehicle trips um, forecasted for this site uh, that would be generated um, and when added to the existing area traffic will not require any new infrastructure to support this application. So no new costs to the town. Next slide, please. Um, several matters have been raised by the public, and I've I've hit a lot, I've hit quite a few of them as I've gone through my presentation, and I will touch on a couple more as uh, as I get to the end of this presentation. Um, a couple items I just want to 
talk about here, uh, there was some questioning the community benefits that were received from this proposal. So I wanna make sure we're clear that um, this proposal isn't looking for bonusing. They're uh, asking for a 12 story height limit, which is permitted. Uh, there was some confusion at one time that uh, this, was, this was a 14 story building and 12 stories was permitted and there was some bonusing for additional two stories. That's not the case. They are not asking for any bonus thing on this site. Uh, there, was some there was some public comments with regards to consideration of green space and uh, green space in the form of private amenity space has been included um, within the proposed rooftop terraces. Uh, the parks department when reviewing the application did not raise concern for um, uh, about a shortage of green space in this area to accommodate the new residents. It is something we can have another talk about talk with uh, Parks Department during the site plan application. And then finally, conflict raised with the emergency pedestrian access off of Church Street. Uh, as I mentioned just a little bit earlier, we we did take a look at that and through the bylaw that I'm about to talk to you about in a minute, um, we have prohibited uh, vehicular access using that Church Street um, access point. Next slide, please. So the bylaw before you tonight uh, has a few modifications um, to facilitate the development um, from to rezone the property from central business district to mixed use four, which then implements the official plan. So the following the slide presents a few of those or presents the um, modifications that we're looking at um, that are included in the bylaw. So with regards to yards. Uh, we're looking at establishing the development footprint um, by including minimum and maximum yards um, all, on all sides of the develop of all sides of the site and looking at permissions for the building to extend out between the third and sixth floor. So what this does is it pushes the first and second floor in to allow for that public realm. Um, and then it allows for some cantilevering of the uh, building to project out a, a from the third and sixth floor. Um, so that is uh, that is included in the bylaw. Also, we're looking at restricting the stairs and the air vents that are associated with the parking structure um, within yards facing the public realm. One thing we looked at with regards to the air vents is not, not allowing air vents below 4.5 meters on any face of the building. So that as you're walking down through the public realm and a nice maybe patio space, you're not blasted by an air vent. So we have raised uh, the regulations to, uh, to keep them uh, above and beyond um, that, the public realm limit there. Parking rates, we are looking at a maximum uh, parking ratio of 1.5 parking spaces um, and that includes visitor parking. Uh, we are looking to, we have put in a provision to uh, per, permit shared parking between visitor parking spaces, non-residential um, to a limit of 0 0.15 per unit. Um, we've, we've prohibited surface parking areas. Uh, we are looking for a minimum of 20% of the total parking spaces to be equipped with uh, um, electric vehicle equipment. And as I said before, we're prohibiting the vehicular access off of Church Street. Next slide, please. So I just wanna go through process and next steps on this one just quickly. Um, so the current process where we are right now, so staff um, through my recommendation report, we're recommending um, approval of the rezoning application and passing of the bylaw with holding conditions for um, from the region with regards to servicing and an environmental site assessment that they need to have upgraded or sorry, updated. Um, the bylaw regulates development footprints, setbacks and yards, heights, maximum parking rates to facilitate the proposal in a site specific provision. Well, that's the current, where we are currently. A future process um, down the road includes they would have to submit, the applicant um, would have to submit a removal of um, the holding conditions as I just outlined by the region. They would, um, they have agreed. So, and I, I just wanna say the site is actively being marketed. So it is for sale. Um, the applicant is still sort of um, considering developing the site themselves. 
they are, if they choose to develop the site themselves, they are interested in entering discussions with the town on looking at the design of the underground parking garage to see if it would support public parking um, and a, an arrangement with the town to provide public parking on site um, because they, they do have um, about 56 spaces above what we would normally require. Um, through the 1.5 parking spaces per unit. So there's an addition of parking there. They are willing to, to start discussing public parking arrangements. If the site art is to be sold, I've asked them to keep us in planning in the loop so that we can reach out to the new owners before they get too far in a site plan package. And we can have those discussions with uh, our parking uh, department to look at um, those arrangements being continued with the new owner. So I'm hoping to do that before a site plan application um, or a pre-consultation comes in because in that way we would be able to meet many of our standards for an underground parking garage that we would need to allow for those arrangements to be put in place. So a site plan application would then come in and uh, the review of that site plan application with regard to the Appendix B, which is on the agenda, which is part of my staff report tonight, those urban design requirements would be included in the review of that site plan application to make sure that they're implemented. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, staff put forward the following recommendations as shown for council's consideration that the proposed uh, zoning bylaw application submitted by Randall Oakville Developments and Church Oakville Developments be approved on the basis that the application is consistent with the provincial policy statement, conforms with all applicable provincial plans, uh, the region of Halton official plan, the livable Oakville plan has regard for matters of provincial interest and represents good planning for the reasons outlined in my report. That bylaw 2022-006, which is an amendment to zoning bylaw 2014-014 be passed, that in accordance that, sorry, that the notice of council's decision reflect that council's fully considered all the written and oral submissions related to these matters and that those comments have been appropriately addressed that in accordance with section 13, 3417 of the Planning Act, no further notice is determined to be necessary, and that the site plan for the proposed development be designed in accordance with the urban design requirements included in Appendix B to this report uh, from the Planning Services Department. Thank you, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Collingwood. Uh, Councillor Hazlitt Deal. Thank you, Ms. Collingwood. And uh, I want to just extend my thanks to the staff for um, some of the significant um, adjustments that have been made on the application since it was first submitted. Um, uh, you know, the, there's improved setbacks, the terracing is uh, a plus, and of course, um, the streetscape is something that will be complementary to uh, downtown. Um, I would like to encourage, and um, I'm glad to see that the urban design guidelines are part of um, are up for a further discussion um, that the, uh, the developer consider um, the materials that they're using so it feels more truly complementary to the Heritage District. Um, progress has been made. I would suggest that uh, greater progress needs to be made given it, it will be part of the gateway uh, coming in uh, to downtown. Um, and I'm sure that um, uh, that greater, uh, greater discussion will net um, a, a project that everybody can be tremendously proud of. My only two um, questions, and I know Councillor Giddings had a few, has car share been discussed with this um, applicant um, as a possibility? So rather than, um, uh, most people are familiar with what car share is, but rather than something having to own a car, they could pick up a zip or a Nuno or whatever, um, for their needs versus having to have um, a permanent parking spot. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have not had that discussion with them regarding car share. We used to, uh, during rezoning process, because we would try to regulate some of that, um, some of those uh, spaces towards car share. Um, it isn't something that's easily regulated and or monitored. So that is something that we will be looking at through the site plan um, and including in a site plan agreement if it's deemed to be uh, necessary for the site. Okay. Well, it certainly would be beneficial for the, the residents. Um, in terms of the number of units, um, I'm, again, I, I'm 
on, on what are the size of these units? Are we talking, are they proposing one, two, three? Do we have, are they committing at all at this point? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I, based on the, they were they were proposing a um, a mix of, of units. I don't have the percentages in front of me. I apologize, but they were proposing a mix of units. However, the commitment isn't necessarily fully there because they are marketing the site. So the site is marketed for a height um, max. There is no cap to the number of units, um, and there is no restriction to the type of units. So that is something that we will fully have a conversation. We'll fully have through the site plan application. Okay. Um, sorry, and my final uh, confirmation: the twelve-story building beside it, um, height, uh, you know, inches or feet, you know, comparison. Is it is it identical in height? Because twelve-story can feel can be one height and, and a different height. Are are they, are they, are they pretty darn close? Three, Mr. Mayor, at the height limit back a year ago when we did the public staff meeting, I got the, I got the um, numbers and the height for a resident who was asking and the number completely escapes me. I apologize, counselor. I will get that number for you, but it is fairly comparable. I do believe um, Randall sits a little bit higher, but I will confirm that. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Hazlitt-Teal. Councillor Giddings. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Collingwood, you talked about parking, I believe uh, 144, 1.5 per, leaving 60 odd spaces. Um, and you were gonna talk about a uh, parking arrangement with the proponent at, at, in the future. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, yes. Um, so, Depending on where the site lands um, and who who ends up owning it, uh, I have reached out to um, Director Jim Barry to talk about if this is an if this is a site of interest for public parking, um, uh, and the answer was yes. So I have let the uh, owner of the lands know that we are interested in having that discussion. It needs to be an early discussion before they get too far with designing the underground garage because we do have specific standards that need to be uh, adhered to. So that uh, we will we'll continue that discussion, keep our eyes on the site. Um, and if we find out the site has been purchased, we do need to follow up quickly to see if we can continue those conversations. Uh, great, uh, 65 spaces available between the commercial and the office space that's gonna be located in this building could result in weekend only parking, I take it? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that will have to be looked at through a parking justification study with regards to the site plan. Once the types of uses in the, um, the ground floor area of the space is allocated um, in a growth area for office and uh, commercial uses, there's no parking requirement for those uses. So those uses, that's where we could look at a little bit of shared parking with regards to the visitor spaces. Um, the parking justification study could help us take a look at what that maybe maximum, what that leftover um, number of parking spaces um, is that we can look at for the public parking. Thank you for that. Uh, parking in the downtown area is always a, uh, uh, a subject of rich discussion, particularly with the, a number of the businesses and uh, commercial uh, entities that would desperately like to locate there. And just wanted to reiterate, uh, in terms of the look in the materials, that's one thing that uh, Heritage Advisory was concerned about and uh, Councillor Janet and I have heard from a large uh, segment of the public in terms of this being adjacent to the Heritage District, uh, the CBD, and that it's uh, vital that we get this right. And so that's going to continue on, is it? Hey, Mr. Mayor, yes, um, this will continue. This site is the the um, the finalization of the rezoning does not end <laughs> the discussion on this site. Um, it has been a lively discussion over the last year and a half. It will continue to be so. Uh, a lot of public input, a lot of interest from the Heritage Committee, and uh, a lot of interest from our urban design staff. Let the work begin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Giddings. Um, are you satisfied enough to move it? 
Thank you. Council, is there any objection to Councillor Giddings' motion? Madam Clerk, there being no objection, the motion carries. Council, we now come to the recommendation report for the Omnibus Zoning Bylaw Amendment, and Catherine Buckerfield, the planner, is available for a presentation. And uh, Ms. Buckerfield, uh, we look forward to your uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> I think my slides will be up shortly. Thank you, Mayor Burton, members of council and members of the public tuning into tonight's meeting. This presentation is in relation to item 7.2 on tonight's agenda. A town initiated zoning bylaw amendment has been prepared by staff in the form of an omnibus housekeeping amendment bylaw 2022-007. The purpose of this proposed omnibus amendment to the Town of Oakville Zoning Bylaw 2009-189 as amended is to make a number of housekeeping, technical, and other modifications affecting all zones, which would assist in the use and interpretation of the North Oakville Zoning Bylaw and implement the official plan. Many of the amendments also serve to align the North Oakville Zoning Bylaw with the South Oakville Zoning Bylaw. The report and appendix in A and B can be found under item 7.2 of tonight's agenda. As you are aware, this item was previously before Council at the November 1st, 2021 Planning and Development meeting at which a public meeting was held. Council passed a motion that the bylaw uh, to make housekeeping technical and other modifications to zoning bylaw 2009-189 as amended be deferred to a future Planning and Development Council meeting for additional consultation with landowners. Staff contacted those that sub submitted letters or delegated and held a consultation on November 30th, 2021 with various members of the North Oakville Community Builders Inc, otherwise known as NOCB, where staff received feedback on the drafted bylaw amendment, which is now named bylaw 2022-007. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to seek approval from Council based on the recommendations put forth by staff in the form of a decision, again noting the technical nature of the proposed amendments. Next slide, please. The North Oakville Zoning Bylaw 2009-189 as amended applies to all lands north of Dundas Street and south of Highway 407. These lands are affected by the proposed amendments to the text and mapping. A number of individual sites are also affected by the proposed amendment through the um, amended site-specific regulations. Next slide, please. Amendments are proposed to sections one to nine and sections 11 and 12 of the North Oakville Zoning Bylaw. Next slide, please. This slide reflects the various definitions identified by staff to date that required modification and are captured within the staff report and draft bylaw. Next slide, please. A key update which results in many of the proposed amendments is the renaming of the existing development ED zone to future development FD. This change is proposed to emphasize that the intention for lands in the, in the zone are for future development in accordance with the town's official plan, secondary plans, regional official plan, and provincial policies beyond what is currently existing on a property. None of the zone provisions will change, but the intention of the zone would be clearer to the users of the zoning bylaw. Next slide, please. As mentioned, staff met with representatives of NOCB on November 30th and discussed solutions to their concerns with the draft housekeeping bylaw. As a result of these discussions, staff are bringing back the draft bylaw renamed from Bylaw 2021-125 to Bylaw 2022-007 with an update which clarifies how the height of a one-story addition permitted through footnotes in section 7.6.2 and 7.7.2 of the zoning bylaw is measured. Rather than measuring from grade as previously proposed, the first story height will be measured from the finished floor level of the first story. This clarification will continue to meet the intent of the zoning bylaw and will clarify their interpretation going forward. Words that are highlighted and crossed out have been removed from the draft bylaw and words that are highlighted and underlined have been added. Draft bylaw 2021-007 as amended continues to be consistent with the provincial policy statements, conforms to the growth plan, Alton's region, Alton region's official plan and the town's official plan. The proposed mm -hmm. updates are still within the notice provided to the public in advance of the November 1st, 2021 Planning and Development Council meeting and therefore initial, additional notice is not required. The representatives of NOCB did not have any other concerns with the proposed bylaw as drafted. Staff had the opportunity to meet with representatives of NOCB earlier today to hear additional feedback on their use of the zone North Oakville zoning bylaw, which was outside the scope of this town initiated housekeeping bylaw. It was a positive discussion and staff look forward to continuing the dialogue. We now have the opportunity to review their feedback and consider whether aspects could be incorporated into a future housekeeping bylaw or whether a concern is outside the scope and would be better suited for further study. 
any proposed updates as a result of this discussion will need to meet the intent of the official plan and be consistent with the town's goals and development in North Oakville. Next slide, please. In conclusion, Mayor Burton, staff put forth the following recommendation as shown for council's consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, council, are, if there are no questions, I, and I don't see any, let me ask uh, Councillor Sandu if you're uh, content to move this. Thank you very much. Uh, Council, is there any objection to the motion by Councillor Sandu to approve the housekeeping bylaw? Madam Clerk, there is no objection, and so that is carried. We now have uh, the main event of the evening. Uh, for many people, that's certainly what's drawn our audience tonight. And that is the update report on the regional official plan review and the uh, also known as the integrated growth management strategy, uh, which goes by the jargon mouthful of IGMS. And uh, we have a, a report from our staff and a presentation from Kirk Bigger, our senior planner for policy planning and heritage. And we have 16 registered delegations. As I announced at the start of the meeting, but I'm gonna go through it again uh, for the benefit of anybody who's joining us late, a substitute recommendation from the one in the agenda has been put forward by Councillor Elgar. And I'm gonna ask the clerk to put that up again. And I'm, and, uh, and I'm gonna accept his motion to get that on the floor so everybody knows what we're uh, looking at. And, uh, after the presentation, we'll have delegations. Uh, and then, uh, well, after the presentation, if council have questions for Mr. Bigger, we'll have those. Then we'll have delegations. Then council can make comments, debate with each other, whatever uh, happens. And we'll see if the substitute recommendation will carry. The recommendation is that the report from planning be received and that council endorse the criticisms by our planning staff of the Halton draft preferred growth concept that this motion saying that and the town staff with the criticisms in it be submitted to the region as part of the uh, region's review and that this motion uh, and the report with the criticisms be shared with the city of Burlington, the town of Halton Hills, the town of Milton the Credit Valley Conservation, the Grand River Conservation, and Conservation Halton. All of those agencies have a little piece, well, in, in the case of Conservation Halton, most of our watershed, but Halton embraces pieces of the watersheds and the other conservation authorities, and so they all have an interest in this matter, and that's why they're being circulated. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, you can take that down. Thank you very much. And... Uh, Council in public, uh, let's give our attention to uh, Mr. Bigger, uh, and uh, I look forward to his presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, members of council. It's great to see everyone dug out from the snow, and a happy new year as well. Uh, this report presents an overview of Halton Region's draft preferred growth concept. Um, and just a few opening remarks to set the stage here. Uh, throughout the OP review, the region's OP review, staff have engaged with regional staff in a, in a productive dialogue in order to address growth management across Halton Region and to support the implementation of the town of Oakville's townwide urban structure. The town staff appreciate the complexities involved in managing provincially required population and employment growth at a regional scale, while at the same time enabling local municipal plans and policies. There we go. I was gonna spend a little bit of time clarifying the recommendation this evening, but Mayor Burton and the revised recommendation has done that. I'll just add uh, to support that, really this is a region's project and we are providing information to the region. Um, so when we use that term endorse, it was endorsing the comment, the comments contained within the report. Oakville's perspective as information to the region, it wasn't intended at all and, and doesn't mean that we're supporting or endorsing the preferred growth concept through this work tonight. So, 
Certainly. Um, if, if, uh, if certainly staff are satisfied with that wording to, to clarify. Oh, okay. So Mayor Burton has asked me to, to, uh, to clarify that town staff are supportive of that, of that recommendation. So what you're looking for? Great. Uh, so just starting from the top, the province um, provincial growth plan, it's called a place to grow, and it provides for growth forecasts of population and employment to be accommodated across the plan area to the horizon year of 2021. Uh, so this is the Greater Golden Horseshoe, uh, and Halton and Oakville are, are featured prominently within that. Uh, the growth plan for Halton region to the year 2051 is to accommodate 1.1 million people and 500,000 jobs. So Halton is undertaking a regional official plan review uh, as required by the Planning Act, and this review will update the policies of that, or of that uh, regional plan in conformity with the growth plan as well as other plans and policies at the provincial level. Um, this review is to accommodate population and employment growth across the region. A key component of the region's review to address this aspect of growth plan conformity is called the Integrated Growth Management Strategy. And as Mayor Burton pointed out, I'll try and stay out of the jargon and stay away from the acronyms, although the report is, is uh, certainly heavy on that. Uh, the strategy has been underway for quite some time and has involved uh, a significant amount of analysis and review of some growth concepts, which tested where and how the region could grow and to manage future population and employment across, across this area. The strategy is now at a stage where it has produced a draft preferred growth concept for broader consideration and for public engagement. Just a couple more considerations before we get into the content of, of, that, uh, of that concept. Um, Halton Region, including Oakville, are currently planned or already planned to the year 2031. And this is a result of previous planning exercises that some of you may be familiar with, which include the Little Oakville process from uh, 2009 and Sustainable Halton from around that same time. Uh, this regional official plan review is now addressing growth management for the period 2031 to 2051. So that's important to keep, keep in mind as we go forward. Uh, and it's also important to remember that the growth plan at the provincial level prescribes this employment and population growth. And that's intended to be viewed uh, as a minimum amount to be accommodated. And so it's not, it's not a cap, it's a minimum amount. And, and uh, certainly in Oakville, we know, if we, we know we have capacity to accommodate uh, lots of good growth. So onto the draft preferred growth concept. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a good concept. It's proposing to allocate most of the new growth coming to the region from 2031 to 2051 within the existing settlement areas. And so on this figure, which is from the, the, uh, from the report, uh, this would be the purple and the yellow areas on the, on the figure. The draft preferred growth concept is also proposing a settlement area boundary expansion onto agricultural land to accommodate new greenfield growth. Uh, and this breaks down in two ways. Uh, to accommodate new population and housing, about 1,050 hectares are being proposed for expansion, and those highlighted here, uh, the, red, the red areas that are encircled here. And similarly, 1,070 hectares are being proposed to accommodate new employment growth. And so altogether, that's about 2,120 hectares proposed for new greenfield expansions. Uh, the draft pre uh, preferred growth concept is also proposing a region-wide minimum intensification target to accommodate new res residential growth of 40 45%. This is below the minimum 50% required by the growth plan. So throughout the region's official plan review and the integrated growth management strategy, town staff have consistently expressed support for a growth concept for Halton region that minimizes settlement area boundary expansions directs growth to strategic growth areas, encourages transit supportive and compact mixed use development, and addresses the climate emergency. Uh, staff are of the opinion that settlement area boundary expansions should be viewed as a last option after opportunities to accommodate growth within the existing settlement areas have, have been exhausted. Uh, so some, within that context, some strategic expansions may be warranted to help 
develop com complete communities and provide for community infrastructure. Uh, the regional official plan review process is all about finding a balance between market demand, required policy, and principles of good planning. Um, town staff appreciates the challenge the region faces in developing a concept that satisfies aspects of the market while at the same time conforming to the build up and rather, rather build out policy requirements of the growth plan. So this uh, preferred growth concept does propose to implement the regional urban structure of strategic growth areas uh, and uh, along uh, high order transit corridors. And by extension, that would implement Oakville's townwide urban structure. Uh, through previous work done at the region, Oakville's urban structure has been embedded into the, the new regional urban structure through previous amendments. Um, I just wanted to reiterate what Oakville's urban structure is intended to do. And first, what it does is it protects the natural heritage system, uh, cultural heritage, um, it then and parks and open space. It's intended also to maintain stability of established areas. And finally, it directs growth to a, in a coordinated way to uh, a system of nodes and corridors. So that's really what our urban structure is intended to do. And that's what we're implementing through all this work. Uh, for Oakville, through the preferred growth concept, by 2051, we'd be looking at a population number of 375,000 uh, residents and 180,000 jobs. Uh, and we believe here that that, that level of growth will allow us to continue to develop complete communities that are transit supportive, uh, that provide for compact mixed-use development, a range and mix of housing uh, will help to reduce emissions and will help us to meet the climate challenges that, that we're facing. As far as next steps are concerned, um, the region's timeline is uh, coming forward with the preferred growth concept, draft pref or actually preferred growth concept report in February, February 9th, so that'll be a big meeting and it's not that far off. Um, and then um, they will be moving through a statutory process to begin to adopt amendments to the regional official plan through uh, the first part of this year, March and May. Uh, and the province has established a conformity deadline of July 1st, 2022. And so we're in the lead up to, to finalizing the region's official plan review as much as it relates to conformity with provincial policies and, and plans. So here's a recommendation again, which I won't spend any more time on, as it has been, um, has it been, re it has been revised and clarified. And lastly, I'd just like to, to conclude by saying that this, uh, we're pleased to see that this, this item has generated so much interest um, locally and regionally. We, we also appreciate the public comments that have been received through our process. So thank you for listening, uh, and I'd like to open up the meeting to questions and delegations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bigger. Uh, Council, I'll turn to you first. Uh, you can, of course, hold your questions for later. Uh, if you want to uh, hear from the delegations next, I'm good with that. And I note that we have a special request from uh, the leader of Oakville Green to be heard before 7 because of a, a conflict at 7. And so uh, thanks to the latitude given me by the procedure bylaw, it would be my intention, if you're ready for delegations, to start with uh, Karen Brock. Since no one objects, Madam Clerk, would you uh, please uh, begin calling the delegations and begin with uh, Ms. Brock. Our first delegation speaking to this item is Karen Brock. Welcome, Ms. Brock. We look forward to your information. Good evening, and, and thank you, uh, Your Worship, for the accommodation tonight. Uh, I do have a, a board meeting, so I'm uh, very appreciative. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, I think, um, as was mentioned, I'm Karen Brock, and I'm representing Oakville Green Conservation, uh, Oakville's largest residence association. So uh, I did just want to make a note um, I was here, Mayor Burton, when you mentioned that there was a substitute recommendation for this item. Uh, and I wanted to clarify what this means, presumably that there will be no vote tonight. Um, it means that 
Council is going to vote to forward the staff criticism of the uh, preferred growth concept to the region and to share it with the other partners we have in the enterprise called Halton Region. And for greater clarity, Council is not endorsing the region's draft preferred growth concept. That's, that's what it means. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, I still felt it was important for me to speak to you tonight um, before the vote by all regional councillors on February 19th. So um, this, obviously what I'm presenting tonight was written uh, before I heard the, uh, of the substitute recommendation. So um, I'll try and make corrections as I go. Hmm. So tonight, Council is being asked to consider Halton Region's proposed preferred growth concept, which includes turning over 5,000 acres of farmland and green space for development in Milton and Halton Hills. We know that Oakville is built out. This growth option is being billed by some as a compromise or balanced, but it would be unconscionable to condone continued expensive, unsustainable suburban sprawl in a declared climate emergency. Endorsing the preferred growth concept is premature. There are very crucial considerations, studies and pieces of information missing as noted in the Town of Oakville staff report. Some major studies will only be conducted after the vote, which seems backwards. This is corroborated by staff's comments and I quote, there remains a significant concern with the, the sequence of the uh, ROPR or the Regional Official Plan Review work plan and the priority in which manners are being addressed, matters are being addressed, it appears out of order to be dealing with fundamental policies on agriculture, the natural heritage system, and climate change after growth management matters have been decided at regional council. End of quote. The Oakville staff report lays out concerns and objective warnings for the proposed growth plan. It states that expanding into green fields will not mitigate climate change emergency. And I quote, decisions to expand settlement areas will permanently alter future land uses in Halton region. Furthermore, the region's climate change analysis has demonstrated that expanding communities into new green field areas will not help mitigate climate change emergency compared to intensifying growth within compact communities and established built up areas. Staff also warn of the irreversible nature of such a monumental decision, irreversible. And I quote, once lands are designated for urban development through a settlement area boundary expansion, that decision is unlikely to be reversed, even if it is later determined that those lands are not required to accommodate growth. And this would, was mentioned as a possibility. Staff in the same reports uh, stated, I quote, throughout the integrated growth management strategy, town staff have consistently expressed support for a preferred growth concept that does not open up new lands for development and that, achieve, and that achieves a high rate of intensification within a defined urban structure. So there's that, that same phrase again. And the conclusion from the town staff uh, it seems that in its report to council, st uh, council, staff are far, far from recommending the preferred growth concept and have thrown out many, many warnings objectively, but these are warnings we have to heed. And, and obviously this, the, um, this growth concept will be going uh, to uh, Halton Region Council in February. A wise colleague summarized this growth decision so perfectly in two succinct points. Land use decisions in North Halton do impact us all and impact the future for all of us. We're all Halton residents, and thus we expect all elected officials at the regional table to be applying a region-wide lens on this decision. Secondly, there are no borders when it comes to the impacts of escalating climate change and local food security. I bring to your attention the results published by Halton Region after virtual public input. There was no, couldn't, uh, because of COVID, uh, there's nothing in person. Um, and this poll uh, was published uh, from fall of 2021. 
62% of participants of the poll were in favor of a no urban boundary expansion. This is a significant endorsement by residents and constituents. I just wanna remark that this distant second option was only supported by 15% of residents. And in the same report, Halton asked residents to identify the top three themes for the development of a growth concept. Residents clearly prioritized three things, addressing climate change, protecting agricultural land and the farm economy, and affordability of housing followed closely by choice in, uh, choice in housing options and maximizing the preservation of natural heritage. The preferred growth concept does none of these things. We cannot sprawl our way to housing affordability. We can and we must address these issues without devouring more greenfield. This sounds like the voice of the people with a pretty clear message that councillors should heed. Be suspicious of placating statements about ongoing monitoring or that we've got lots of farmland, don't worry, or this won't affect us now, it's a long way off. Make no mistake. This type of placation fails to address the actual fact that if 5,000 acres is opened up for development as pre the preferred growth concept, it's gone. Really gone. Gone forever. The decision by councillors within Halton will lock in land use for the next 30 years to 2051. It may be the most crucial and visible decision that you ever make as a councillor. Do you really want to be fatal? facilitating sprawl. On principle, hold the line, hold the line, send planners back to the drawing board and ask them to sharpen their pencils. Taxpayers and future generations will thank you if you heed the advice of the Oakville staff report and make a decision to reject the preferred growth concept. Oakville Green is not in favor of the preferred growth concept. We are asking for a no urban boundary expansion option, any compromise would be unconscionable and ill-advised. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brock, for your information. Are there questions for the delegation? Thank you, Ms. Brock. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you call the next delegation? The next delegation is Ron McKee. Mr. McKee, welcome. Council looks forward to your information. Hello, can you uh, hear me now? Yes, we can, and we can see you as well, and we're delighted to uh, hear your information. Thank you very much. Uh, I come before you wearing two hats. First, I have been a resident and homeowner in Ward 3 for 34 years. Secondly, I am a professional engineer with considerable experience in the field of environmental assessment. This background led me to my current role as a volunteer, helping the town of Oakville collect an extensive amount of data concerning our community's response to climate change. The data collection follows a format established by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, an organization um, that I know you depend on for advocacy and financial support. The town's first annual data submission was last September, and next month, when the National Climate League report is released, you will find out exactly how our municipality compares to others across Canada. Benchmarks used for this comparison concern not only greenhouse gas emissions, but also the livability of a community particularly its lack of sprawl and dependency on the automobile. And this leads us to the update report prepared by your planning services department. The report says that the town offers qualified support for Halton's plan to expand the existing settlement area boundary over an area of 2,120 hectares. That's 5,000 239 acres 
to accommodate new greenfield growth in Milton and Halton Hills. On page 17, however, it clearly states, and I quote, that expanding communities into new greenfield areas will not help mitigate the climate change emergency. It also says there is an incongruity in the analysis, which Halton's consultant justified by predicting a demand for so-called ground-oriented housing. In other words, Halton assumes people prefer to buy sprawling, low-rise development. But Oakville's planners warn that actual demand may not match such a forecast. There is no compelling argument in this update report to justify expansion of urban boundaries in Halton. The top of page three indicates that Oakville agrees with the plan only because expansions in Milton and Halton Hills would not impact its own structural plan. Last Friday, Mayor Burton provided extensive additional background in his daily email update. But that material only reinforced the notion that Halton's plan is flawed and does not address the climate emergency. The newsletter also noted that punitive action could be taken by the provincial housing ministry if the plan was rejected. But in an election year, this is an empty threat. And it just confirms that the provincial government is a climate denying bully. The mayor's second concern is that people might take their business elsewhere. And to that I say, they will then find themselves living in an unsustainable, sprawling community in the future, while we thrive because we stuck to our guns today. There is more than enough land within Halton's existing urban boundaries. A degree of densification is not only acceptable, but desirable to create a more sustainable and climate-friendly community. I'm sure that there are many voters like me who expect their representatives at all levels of government to genuinely support climate action and the creation of livable communities without sprawl and without cutting into our precious existing green spaces. So ladies and gentlemen of the council, I implore you to not endorse this update report or in light of the revised recommendations before you, endorse only the criticisms of the Halton Regional Plan. And in any event, please send the Halton planners back to the drawing board. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. McKee, for your information. Council, are there questions for the delegation? Mr. McKee, thank you very much for your time and effort. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please uh, call the next delegation? The next delegation is Aki Tanaka. Ms. Tanaka, welcome. Council looks forward to your information. Uh, hello, we can almost hear you, and we, uh, there, now that you're unmuted, yeah, I better? think we'll be good, yes. Okay, sorry. Mayor Burton and Councillors, my name is Aki Tanaka, and I am a retired engineer. I live in Ward 2. I'm here as a representative of Oakville Climate Action, a group of 170 members that was formed after the climate strikes in front of Oakville Town Hall in September of 2019. I'm also a member of the Oakville Community Climate Health. I'm speaking to you today to ask you to receive the report attached to the agenda item 7.3 and pay particular attention to the Oakville planning staff's clear objections to the draft preferred growth concept. And I believe that the revised recommendation um, is an indication that, that you will do that. I'm hoping that the objections can be tabled separately somehow um, for emphasis. 
This means that regional councillors and the mayor should not endorse the draft preferred drug concept at regional council. It is clear in the report that the Oakville planning staff disagree with the Halton planning staff. The report states that the Oakville planning staff have concerns with the draft preferred growth concept regarding one, settlement area boundary expansion because any expansion area would be taken from the agricultural land base and two, the reduction of the minimum intensification target, which is 45% instead of the 50% required by the provincial growth plan. The town planners also questioned the land needs assessment methodology, stating that the land needs assessment previously underestimated market demand for apartment housing in Oakville. The planners also question whether the land needs assessment is overestimating demand for single family dwelling housing in other parts of the region. The report states, quote, town staff remain concerned that the region's integrated growth management strategy and the development of the preferred growth concept may be based on an overemphasis of market demand at the expense of required policy and principles of good planning. End of quote. Um, this is a clear indication of differences between the town planners and the regional planners. Land use planning is a powerful tool that municipalities have for mitigating and adapting to the climate emergency that is upon us in Canada, Ontario, Halton, and Oakville. Halton Region's climate analysis has demonstrated that expanding communities into new green areas will not help to mit mitigate the climate emergency. Once that decision is made and green fields are developed, it is irreversible, meaning that we lose farmland and open areas forever. Land use decisions in North Halton impact us all, and there are no borders when it comes to the impact of, climate, of the climate emergency and local food security. I am open to seeing my neighborhood become a model for neighborhoods in the future via dental intensification. I'm truly hoping that Oakville can become a model for urban living in the future, where we can live, work, go to school, shop and play in a place where there are a wider range of housing choices. I commend this council for voting to declare a climate emergency in June 2019. Now in 2022, is the time to support that declaration by rejecting the draft preferred growth concept at regional council. Thank you to all who have been involved in the complex regional official plan review process, particularly the town planning staff. Mayor and Council, thank you for listening and all the work that you are doing for Oakville during this difficult time. Thank you, Ms. Tanaka, for your uh, remarks and your information. Council, are there questions for Ms. Tanaka? Ms. Tanaka, thank you very much for your effort tonight. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please uh, call the next delegation? The next delegation is Dorothy Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop, welcome. We will wait for the Zoom technology to make you appear. Well, I didn't think we'd wait that long. Is she there? Okay, she's there, and the technology is just moving slowly, I guess. Ms. Dunlop, can you, can you hear us? There, now you should hear me. Yes, thank you. Delighted Great. to hear Thank you. you. <laughs> um, welcome. Council looks forward to your information. Please begin. Thank you. I'm a senior citizen who is a longtime resident of Oakville. First, I'd like to thank the council for your dedication in helping to make Oakville one of the best places in Canada to live. By speaking as a delegate, I'm hoping that your actions tonight will determine a forward-thinking, innovative approach to our future growth. According to Statistics Canada 2016, there were just over 100,000 people aged 50 years of age and older in Oakville from a population of around 194,000. Many of us are trying to downsize. 
I would love to continue to live in my neighborhood surrounded by mature trees. My large lot would easily accommodate an elegant semi-detached house, but our current zoning does not allow it. Instead, they will allow a monstrous energy guzzling house that will necessitate cutting down mature 100 year old trees. So my next alternative is to move to a semi-detached or a townhouse, but where? We need these structures in mature areas. We're not going to buy box townhouses on stripped land or more single family homes out in the suburbs. Intensification will give us better transit and save us tax dollars as new infrastructure is not needed. People who can afford a single dwelling can buy our houses if you give us an alternative housing solution. We sorely need gentle intensification within our neighborhoods. Here's another option. Imagine this scenario. A young couple buys a small home with a space for a garden suite at the back of their property. The rent helps pay the mortgage. When they have kids, they can have live-in help or their parents might choose to move in. When the kids go to university or college, they could live there and not incur incredible debt. Then they can save a down payment for a place of their own. When the now elderly couple needs financial help to pay the taxes or healthcare expenses, they can have a tenant, thus enabling them to stay in their homes and out of a retirement home. These garden homes don't alter the look of the neighborhood and will help us meet our target of new single family homes within our urban boundary. This concept allowed my mother to stay in her home until she was 89 years of age. The only difference is is that hers was a large century-old house with a beautiful garden where the zoning allowed three apartments. She lived on the main floor in the end and had two apartments above. As her children moved out, the tenants moved in. This allowed my mom financial security, assistance maintaining the property, and social interaction. My friends are already talking about co-sharing a house and hiring a caregiver when we're older. And what about the need for intergenerational homes? Toronto's endorsed coach houses, Hamilton has a new zoning for garden suites, as have Guelph, Ferry, and other cities. So my question is, why hasn't Oakville? Where's our plan for new zoning, semi-detached houses, and garden suites? After seeing the consequences of COVID, sticking us all in retirement homes is not an option. But it's not just seniors who need intensification. The majority of the young people I know want to live in a walkable neighborhood with restaurants, parks, and community events. They don't want to live isolated in a suburb where you need two cars and have to drive the kids every night to their activities. So why is the integrated proposal to expand into the valuable farmland and build expensive single family dwellings? Other than the developers, who wants them? This is a 30 year plan. We need to focus on the future as we age, not the past. The proposal is short-sighted, harmful plan based on old data that wastes resources, decreases our food supply, pollutes the environment, and will increase our taxes. Also, since Oakville's council declared a climate emergency, how can you now in good conscience vote yes for a proposal for expansion? Councillors, you have the wonderful opportunity to develop innovative forward planning. Please don't settle for outdated plans like the proposal to expand the urban boundary. Say yes to gentle density within our neighborhoods. Say no to the proposal for expansion. We can plan better. You can make Oakville a poster city for smart, aesthetically appealing intensification. Help keep its reputation as one of the best cities in Canada to live, a model for the rest of the country. Many of us want gentle intensification in our backyard. Please show us your plan for that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dunlop, for your information. Uh, Council, do you have questions for the delegation? Ms. Dunlop, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us tonight. Madam Clerk, uh, would you get the next delegation on board? Next and, deleg and go ahead. Next delegation is Mervyn Russell. All right, while we wait for the technology to produce Mr. Russell, I'll just announce for any who are not aware that secondary units are permitted everywhere in Oakville. And, uh, uh, and furthermore, there's a provincial law that requires every municipality to allow them. 
So there's, there's no question about your ability to build a secondary unit on your, on, on your lot. Uh, and I, I hope that's helpful to those who didn't know that. Uh, let's see, we're still waiting for Mr. Russell. But I have faith in the, the Zoom. <laughs> Well, he must be here because he, he's not in the other. Mm -hmm. he's there. Yeah, I, I see him. Mr. Russell, if you unmute yourself, uh, you, you, you are now able, according to our screen, to unmute yourself and uh, turn on your camera if you wish. Where is my camera? Well, it's on your lower left of your Zoom screen. Uh, in any event, we can hear you. Right. Your... Uh, here we go. Here we go. Here All we go. right. There yeah. you go. Okay. And, and what I'm going to say, actually, Mayor, is not going to take uh, uh, much time uh, at all. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to uh, Council this evening. Um, as most of Councillors know, my name is Mervyn Russell. I'm a retired uh, clergy person living in Oakville for 15 years. I found a member of uh, Hasten. Uh, which is a halt in action for climate emergency now, and also uh, through uh, um, Hasten, a member of uh, Stop Sprawl uh, Halton. Now, uh, my presentation was uh, based, I think, like uh, most of the people who are going to be presenting uh, this evening on the previous set of uh, recommendations. Uh, those have been radically uh, altered. And they've been altered in a way in which I entirely uh, support. Uh, my presentation was uh, going to bring forward the kind of uh, critiques of uh, uh, the uh, pre uh, preferred growth concept, which uh, the Oakville planners have, have set out and uh, was going to uh, advocate that uh, you in actual fact receive uh, this uh, report uh, rather than uh, give any endorsement to it, which might have been uh, confusing. So I think, frankly, any pr presentation that I have prepared in full is uh, unnecessary. Uh, I'm uh, quite happy with uh, the uh, resolutions which are before you, and uh, I'm assured, uh, frankly, from the way in which I've talked to councillors previously, that those recommendations are going to... Uh, be adopted. Of course, this is an outcome that uh, uh, Stop Sprawl Halton will be extremely uh, uh, pleased with. It's uh, along the lines that Burlington has al already uh, adopted as uh, well. But uh, so I'll be now uh, waiting to see what uh, the resolutions uh, are that come forward to the February the 9th meeting at the region. And once I've been able to uh, see those resolutions and if there is any uh, supporting documentation that goes with them, uh, I'll be deciding whether or not that I will want to prepare a presentation for, for that meeting or not. So without wasting you any more of your time, uh, Mayor and Councillors, I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Russell. I assure you that uh, your information never wastes our time. We're happy to see and hear you. Um, Madam Clerk, uh, let me check with Council if any, anyone has a question. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Madam Clerk, would you um, bring in the next delegation? Lucy Sankey is the next de delegation. Right. Ms. Sankey, we're looking forward to hearing from you and hopefully seeing you. And uh, we'll wait for the, the Zoom transfer to work here. Yeah, so I might be under and Chris Hitchcock, um, just for the clerk to remember. So I see, yeah, Chris Hitchcock is talking. That's me, Lucy Sansi. So I'll, as soon as I am allowed to put my video on, I will. All right. Well, we're, uh, hmm, where did you go? I'll find you.
Did I disappear? <laughs> I'm Into not seeing you room. where I expected to see you. Yeah, something happened with my Zoom link and I didn't get one of my own. So I, a friend gave me her link. And so I'm using, yeah, Chris Hitchcock. Okay, well, I think we just had the transfer. I think the transfer just worked because you, here you are. Uh, you are in, um, and uh, my screen says that you're muting, but uh, I, from your voice, I imagine you're not. Yeah. Uh, are you able to turn on your camera? I have no option to. There's not like, I'm looking at the lower left corner and I do not see the camera button. Okay, well, I apologize for, oh, we, we see pictures of you now. Oh, that's, I think, so that's Chris under me. Oh, I see. <laughs> All right. <laughs> look okay, at well, this. <laughs> well, look, uh, we can hear you fine. Apparently you could get her audio, but not her video. So, uh, Please begin. Uh, and we, we can hear you and understand you perfectly well. All right. So hello. Um, thank you, Council and Mayor Burton, for having me today. Um, my name is Lucy Sancy. I have been a resident of Oakville all 23 years of my life. Um, and so I'm very happy to be here today to speak to you. I am here today to speak to you about the future, my future. When you're growing up, adults love to ask you the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And for me, I was really lucky. I always knew what I wanted to be. I've been performing since I was 10 years old and nothing has brought me more joy. I was supported by the, my parents and great teachers all throughout school who helped me step by step to work towards achieving my dreams. When you're small, the future is anything you want it to be. There are endless possibilities of who you can be and what you want your life to be. I remember thinking, the future is mine for the taking. And I also remember when that changed. I was in grade nine and we had this event at our school called Sock Doc, otherwise known as Social Documentary Day. It was a fun day where we didn't have to go to class and instead watch two or three documentaries. One of the ones I picked was called The Cove. Has anyone seen it? If anyone recognizes the name? If you haven't, I would highly suggest you check it out. It's about a secret cove in Japan where aquariums from all over the world come to steal dolphins from their habitat and the leftovers are brutally slaughtered for their meat. I was horrified. I cried for days thinking, how could people do that to some of the smartest animals on this planet? I started to research and realized that things like that were happening all over the world, and not just with dolphins, but with almost every natural resource we had. All of a sudden, the world that was so full of life, so full of opportunities, a world that was promised to me, was slipping away. I shoved the thought to the back of my mind because, you know, who wants to believe that their world is being sold out right from under them? I studied hard, I went to post-secondary, all the while watching the news and feeling more and more disheartened with every headline. I kept picking myself up and kept on going, thinking, well, I have to build a future, don't I? Someone else will handle it. All the while, this sense of anxiousness was growing inside me, and I had no idea where it was coming from. Finally, one day, I realized why I had so much trouble sleeping at night and why sometimes I had days where it was really hard to get out of bed. I was driving along and I saw a Stop Sprawl Halton sign. You know, curious, I went to the website to look it up and I just, I felt like I was being punched in the gut. I couldn't breathe. As my heart was breaking into this intense feeling of hopelessness and betrayal, what I'd witnessed so many years ago was happening in my very own backyard and it wasn't even necessary. I couldn't sleep that night. I cried, so worried about the future that was promised to me getting further and further out of reach. And not just my dreams, but the future of being a living, breathing human on this planet. I decided right then and there that I couldn't sit back any longer and I needed to do something about it. I dived headfirst into all of the issues that were being addressed, and I was shocked to learn that less than 8% of Canada's soil can be used for farming. And on top of that, almost all of the class one soil right here resides in Halton. We have the best soil for crop production, and we are mindlessly paving it over. And for what? For sprawl. And once we pave it over, we lose that soil forever. There is no going back. I then started to look into sprawl and development and found that between 2006 and 2016, only 16% of the land zoned for development in Halton was actually built on, making me think, why are we rushing to take more and more farmland when there's still so much land already zoned for development? 
If we just developed smartly, then we could meet all of our residential and commercial targets set up for us by the government for 2051. The answer seemed so simple, especially since the cost of sprawl is so huge. Sprawl is not only environmentally damaging, but it raises our taxes, our energy bills, and destroying the ability to feed ourselves. During this pandemic alone, we have had to come face to face with the fragility of our supply chain. So the fact that we are here sitting today and talking about the selling of our vital farmland when there's not only another option, but also the Oakville planners themselves don't promote intensification, it just baffles me. Now, I've made mistakes in the past. I used I used to not like the look of condos going up. I didn't understand all this new development here in Oakville, the place where I grew up, or what was going on. But now I do. And I 100% support all of it. Densification will preserve our natural areas, create affordable housing options so that maybe one day I can afford a home, and allow us better opportunities to age in place, and finally give us the numbers to create adequate public transportation here in Oakville. One of the best parts about being a human being is learning and growing. And I think Oakville has a unique opportunity to show other communities what that will look like. I want to be a part of a community that leads by example and makes the future accessible to everyone. I want to be a part of a community that are not only says there's a climate crisis, but also acts on it. And I want to be a part of a community that doesn't just follow the status quo, but that challenges the way we used to do things and knows that there's a better way. And I know that Oakville is and can be that community. We just need your help. And I stand before you today on Zoom because of a global health pandemic, and I am pleading with you that on February 9th, you vote no. I will, you can call me dramatic or emotional, but this is my future. And I will be just one person of many who in 30 years will be dealing with the consequences of what is decided on February 9th. So please say no to intensification and yes to densification when it is already shown through public surveys that options such as 3B are not only an option, but preferred. Let's preserve our farmland for future generations so that they can enjoy everything that we have and that I may finally start to be able to get some sleep at night. Thank you so much for your time and I hope you do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sansi. Uh, are there questions for Ms. Sansi? Thank you for the time you took and the, and the feeling with which you shared your views. I appreciate the earnestness in your voice. Madam Clerk, would you please uh, call the next delegation? The next delegation is Hart Jansen. Maybe the internet is crowded tonight. Everything seems to be slower than, than you expect in this electronic world. But uh, there he is. Welcome, Mr. Jansen. Uh, Council and I look forward to your information. Please begin. Uh, dear Mayor and Councillors, thank you for the opportunity to address the Council this evening. I appreciate the recently amended motion for this agenda item. But of course, the important point is that the growth concept finally adopted by the region consume the minimum amount of farmland possible, preferably zero. I previously provided a written submission, which I have amended substantially since for presentation this evening. For me, this is about sustainability. What does this overused, now virtually meaningless word, sustainability, mean in this context? It means, first and foremost, our ability to continue to live on this planet. If we continue our current practices of overconsumption, high carbon emissions, and continued destruction of farmland and forests, our survival as a species is not viable. That is, it is not sustainable. <clears throat> our overconsumption and high carbon emissions stem largely from our lifestyle. That is, mainly low density housing and use of cars for every activity. Land use planning is the most important lever we have to lock in or lock out carbon emissions. I remember about six years ago, I attended some meetings at the region where the region's official plan was being updated and given a new name, Sustainable Halton. Well, 
they got the name right, but the plan was essentially the opposite of friendly, sustainable Halton regional plan. You must make critical decisions about our environment and our future. We can no longer afford to base these decisions on political expediency. I had the opportunity to see a recent email from Kurt Benson, the director of regional planning, to the regional councillors, in which he answered questions he had been receiving from the regional councillors about the supposedly preferred growth concept. And I call it supposed because we have the name right again, just need to work on the content a bit. In his response, Mr. Benson claimed that the supposedly preferred growth concept addresses climate change. I have to take exception to that and suggest that it must do much more to address climate change. Supposedly shows that emissions in Halton and Oakville have been going up in recent years and not down as was projected in Oakville's community energy strategy, for example. What have we done since declaring the climate emergency to help the residents in Oakville and Halton to lower emissions? Mr. Benson's argument is that, quote, only 14% of the growth will require farmland. Well, this is too much, too much to enable lowering of emissions. If every plan we issue chews up more farmland, ultimately there will be none left. This is a critical opportunity to help set all on the track to lower emissions, well-being of your taxpayers. I quote from a rule when advocates of affordability argue for highways and sprawl. A suburban household costs a city $3,462 per year, while an urban household comes in at less than half of that at $1,416. Fiscally viable cities and regions are compact and dense. And if you Oakville councillors and at the upcoming regional meeting on February 9th, some of your regional council colleagues from Milton and Halton Hills might be upset. This means we have to work harder to help them see how important it is to use a climate lens first and foremost when making critical planning decisions. Sooner or later, the effort of climate advocates will raise the profile of necessary climate action to an important local election issue. We hope for all of our sakes that that day is coming soon. All regional councillors must ask themselves, is the supposedly preferred growth concept really the absolute best the region can do from a climate perspective? The answer has to be no. We have to be able to achieve the region's objection, objectives with a thousand fewer acres of farmland or 2000 less, or better yet with 5,000 acres less. Halton and all of its municipalities have declared climate emergencies. The time to stop sprawl is now, if it wasn't yesterday. So I urge you, listen to your own planning staff, listen to your constituents, listen to the science, listen to the indigenous peoples, listen to your own conscience. Please vote against any additional farmland being included in the urban boundaries. And at the regional meeting on February 9th, please ask regional staff, go back to a growth plan that works without sacrificing any additional farmland. Stop sprawl now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jansen, for your information. Are there any questions for Mr. Jansen? Thank you, Hart. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you bring in the uh, next delegation? The next delegation is Carol Holmes. All right, we're going to have the technological switch again. Everybody put on your patience for a moment. She's in. Here she is. Ms. Holmes, welcome. We can, uh, we can see you, and I noticed that you're unmuted, which is a great way to start. Please begin. 
Okay. Good evening, Mayor Burden and Oakville Councilors. My name is Carol Holmes. I live in Ward 2. I first moved to this beautiful, green, leafy town of Oakville in 1977. I don't think, I think a few of you were not even born, but anyway. I'm representing GASP, Grandmothers and Grand Others Act to Save the Planet. I co-chair GASP with Lorraine Green. We are dynamic, active, growing group, over 100 plus volunteers committed to addressing the climate crisis. And three years ago, we started right here in Oakville to share concerns about climate change and its impact on future generations. We heard the voices of young people pleading, and you heard them tonight, with the adults in power to fight against the worst impacts of climate change. Today, there is much, much eco anxiety among our youth. You know what? We realize those are our grandkids. Those are our grandchildren. And we have a responsibility, especially because it was our generation that contributed so much to polluting the environment. Yes, it's us. We, the wealthy communities, we over consuming our addiction to oil and gas and increased GHG emissions. It was us that has brought the tipping point to the earth's survival. And gas women and others, we acknowledge that responsibility. It's moral, but it's also based in science. And um, a lot of them are your constituents. So we decided right there and then that we would be part of the solution and we have not stopped since. GAS began by supporting the climate emergency declarations in Halton. We were more than impressed with Oakville, our mayor who had a history of environmental leadership and Oakville council that easily passed the climate emergency declaration. Soon all of Halton, they were ready to tackle the climate crisis. For GAS, this is the key. Every decision, every plan in the future would have a climate lens. Uh, the Oakville planning report does describe very well what planning with a climate lens means. And we've been, people have been talking about it all along here. But you know what? The general public doesn't really understand it. But it means developing resilient, affordable, transit supported, complete communities, protecting rural agricultural lands, reducing emissions, meeting climate challenges. And in the last report, very specifically, boundary expansion should only be a very last resort, only when all existing climate areas are exhausted. But it means, and I want to talk more about this, it means progressively planning for more intensification within our boundaries. Yes, reducing urban sprawl, dependence on cars, providing opportunities to live, to work, to play in the same community. Hasn't COVID taught us that? Hasn't COVID demonstrated how beneficial it is to live, to work, to play in our own communities? Last year, when the region presented the gross growth options, we had a niggling suspicion and a worry that the climate lens seemed to be slipping. In fact, climate impacts seemed to be a kind of an afterthought, something to look at after the options were developed. To us, a climate lens has to be integrated in a critical part of the planning process at the front end. And I just want to mention in the excellent report by your planner on the Lions Lane, when she listed all the criteria in which she had to match the project, guess where climate emergency was? After that long list, climate emergency was at the bottom. Pull it up and put it in the top. We do not have a friend. We are saying, no, we don't have a friend in the Ontario government. Curbing emissions is not a provincial priority. That's just not me saying it. That's the Auditor General Bonnie Lysick, who said it in her 2020 report, in her 2021 reports. I can quote it. Things like, Ontario does not make target climate targets a cross-government priority. There are numerous incidents of the province not fulfilling the rules under the Environmental Bill of Rights. Ontario ignored the public's legal right to consultation in environmental decisions. So that's, that's a fact. Now, what about us? What about gas? What about your constituents? What about a very large majority of Canadians? Do they see curbing emissions as a priority? Absolutely. 
And we would back you on actions that would do that. And we're, well, you know, we're resilient. And, uh, you know, we don't give up very easily. This group of 100, I think, and 20 women now at this stage. GHG emissions in Oakville are rising as we speak. So it took us a little back when we were reading that there's a certain resignation happening in Oakville. There's a sense that, well, development is beyond, development beyond urban boundaries is inevitable. The province is just gonna draw the boundaries themselves. To save 5,000 acres of precious fine land, farmland, can't, we can't do it. Speculators have already bought out all the farms. That, well, most development is north, Milton and Halton, really Oakville doesn't really have a say. Those assumptions are not true. There is something we can do. We're not ready to give up the fight and neither should you. What's causing you to give up? Is it intensification? Because I wanna talk about that. Because you see, there's going to be some pushback. I live in the community. I know there's going to be some nimbyism. But you know what, like climate change, when people understand the reasons and the why, and they see that intensification, what it can look like, beautiful mixed mid-rise communities, like the ones they visit on vacation in Europe and South America, and many of the most beautiful cities and places in the world, you see that mix. You know, they'll embrace the concept. Mayor Burton Council gas asks you to get in the fight for climate action against urban sprawl. And I know you're already in it. It's not that I know you're not. I know you are. We'd like to see you initiate a citywide public education program to explain it. People, once they understand, I have lots of faith. You have to have faith in your constituents because they will get it. You know, people, certainly my generation, are ready to make sacrifices sacrifices for the future generations, for the Lucy's of the world. Those are our grandkids. NIMBYism will dissipate. I believe it. <laughs> and uh, I, just to end, I want, want, of course, no to the region preferred option. I support all of the previous speakers. It's not too late to do the last thing. Let's not rush into this. A, dis a decision that's going to lock in growth for 30 years. Let's just table the report exhaust every other avenue, which you are going to do, I know, but I'm asking you to do something very specific in terms of public education, because I think your constituents will back you. Certainly GASP will back you. You see, take time to study. All the studies aren't done. What about the greenhouse gas emissions environmental assessments? Are they in? How about the agricultural system climate input? Is it in? Call for a firm urban boundary, preserve every acre of farmland. You owe it to yourselves. You owe it to your community. You owe it to your grandkids. This decision about the next 30 years growth will be your legacy. Thank you very much for listening to me and the gasps. Thank you, Ms. Holmes, for your passion and your information and your suggestion of uh, public education. I, uh, I have many occasions on other planning council meetings to realize the need for more public education. Um, are there any questions for Ms. Holmes? Ms. Holmes, thank you very much for your time. Madam Clerk, would you bring in the next delegation? The next delegation is Jeannie Gray. Ms. Gray, welcome. Council is looking forward to your information. Thank you very much. We can see you and hear you very well. So please begin. Excellent, thank you very much. Mayor Burton and Oakville councillors. First of all, I wanna say that this is the first time I've ever delegated. And so I'm highly anxious and listening to Lucy earlier tonight saying how she wasn't sleeping. This caused me many sleepless nights as well, but I'm anxious to, to share my, my thoughts with you this evening. Um, again, my name is Jean Gray, and I've lived in Halton Hills for the past 35 years. I'm the proud aunt of three and great aunt of six, and I make this presentation in thinking about their futures tonight. I have relatives who are cash crop farmers who currently farm some of the lands in Halton region. 
I am delegating this evening to share my thoughts on the report found under 7.3 of the agenda. As you know, the official plan is one of the most important legal documents in a region. I offer my compliments to all those individuals who have participated in the creation of the regional official plan review and to the staff in all four regions who have authored subsequent update reports. I have several points to, be, to make and I begin with the first one being timing. In the depths of a dramatic and stressful pandemic, serious climate change and an upcoming provincial election, the request for this work is, is quite frankly ill-timed. Under these conditions, has the region been able to direct all of the resources necessary for a fulsome study, review of the data and consultation with the public? Are there studies and pieces of information missing as noted in the staff report? In early 2021, in light of the pandemic, I know that Halton Regional Council passed a motion to ask the province for more time, more time to conduct studies, get the info and reports to councillors. But as you know, the response was no, 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 no. There can be no delay. Why is the province pushing so hard? My understanding is that development plans are in place for the next 10 years. And so what's the rush? Why don't we just push back? My second point is the importance of the farm and the farmland. Do you know provincial policy states that agriculture land is to be used only as a last resort? Alton Region has always been committed to sustaining a prosperous and progressive agricultural and rural community. In my research, I had no idea that Halton Region is agriculture and farming accounts for about 24% of the jobs in Halton. In 2016, the economic impact of agriculture in Halton Region was approximately $471 million. In the Halton Region Rural Agricultural Strategy, a key goal of the Citizens Priority Action Plan was to, and this plan, by the way, was adopted by the current Regional Council, it was to preserve for current and future generations a landscape that is rich, diverse, balanced, productive, and sustainable, and a society that's economically strong, equitable, and caring. To achieve this goal, the region acknowledged that it must plan for communities where urban sprawl is minimized, where infrastructure is maximized, and where natural heritage is protected, and natural spaces and farmland is preserved. So making a decision to expand the urban boundary to use 5,000 acres of farmland is just not consistent with this goal. And this, this is a goal already established in Halton Region. Climate change is my next one, and I'll be very brief on that because I know several have spoken about this already. The town of Oakville, as you know, declared a climate emergency in 2019. Um, urban expansion will jeopardize the climate change goals that have been set out. What will be the impact of the emissions from increased transportation due to sprawl? According to the Suzuki Foundation, Emissions from transportation are the largest and fastest growing source of greenhouse gases. And you know, urban sprawl won't just damage green space. It would raise flood risks in urban areas, cause municipalities millions of dollars in extra infrastructure stock, uh, costs, and make it ever more difficult to reach the targets that we have in reducing greenhouse emissions to fight climate change. Just yesterday, our own Federal Minister, the new one, the new Environment and Climate Change Minister, Stephen Gilbert, stated that we need to do more and we need to go much faster. There's a sense of urgency. He expressed it. Um, he, he said um, that uh, his quote was to say, people have different views in terms of how to do things, tactics, strategies, and so in the political realm you compromise. I think the key thing is never to compromise on your values and what you believe in. And I was very, very happy to hear that from our minister. With this advice, there should be no doubt that we need to prevent expansion of the urban boundary and keep the 5,000 acres of farmland. Indigenous consultations were referred to earlier tonight. We have a duty to consult with and listen to the indigenous advisors in Halton region to help guide us in the discussions around land use. And I was pleased to read in the Oakville study that in the update report, it acknowledges that indigenous communities have been engaged in the planning process. Have they been listened to? What are their viewpoints? 
As you know, Halton is on the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, part of the Anishinaabe Nation. And all four regions in Halton have a land acknowledgement. And the land acknowledgement in Milton states in part, we stand as allies with the First Nation as stewards of these lands. Are we living up to that commitment if we expand the urban boundary and take 5,000 acres of farmland? Earlier tonight, it was, it was spoken to about consultations. Generally speaking, consultations with the people of Halton have been very difficult during these pandemic times. This is quite understandable. However, true public engagement calls for a broad range of methods through which members of the public become more informed and or influence public decisions. To date, the region has advertised their planning processes and hosted virtual meetings to present the draft plans. But through Zoom meetings, has there really been true public engagement? Are the councillors and the mayor satisfied that the public has had adequate opportunity to become familiar with the regional official plan review? Should more in-depth public consultation take place before the regional councillors are asked to make a decision? I understand that further public consultation is planned to take place once the decision has been made at regional council, but this is truly seeming quite backwards, like the cart before the horse. I was pleased to learn that a poll took place last spring uh, whereby 62% of those responding were in favor of no urban boundary expansion. And that was referred to by one of the earlier delegates this evening. Planners, the draft uh, plan suggests that this growth cannot be fully accommodated within the region's existing designated greenfield areas and the delineated built-up areas within the constructs of provincial policy. Councillors and mayor, it's my understanding that you can instruct staff to bring new recommendations forward that protects Halton's precious farmland and allows for more sustainable growth within our current urban boundaries. Halton Region does not need to accept the land needs assessment that was conducted. We need planners to go back to the drawing board. And I think we heard that from some other people tonight as well. Population target can be achieved through gentle intensification on the land already set aside for development within the current urban boundaries. What kinds of mix of housing can achieve that goal? Miss, missing middle housing provides diverse housing options such as duplexes, fourplexes, multiplexes, and maybe a, an upcoming uh, rising star, the live work building. My last point is legacy and that was just referred to as well. Um, we've been building on some of the best productive farmland in Southern Ontario since the end of World War II. Ontario's losing an average of 175 acres of prime agricultural land every day. We need intensification in more compact suburbs within our existing urban boundary in Halton. The time has come to make a political choice that urban sprawl onto farmland in Halton region is going to stop. The decision you make as councillors will lock in land use in the next 30 years to 2051. Some, in fact, surmise this could be very well the most crucial and visible decision you make as the mayor and or Oakville councillors. This decision itself, before making any decisions on the deferred uh, on the draft preferred growth concept, I urge the councillors and mayor to take the time to educate, dialogue, and listen closely to the constituents. There's a groundswell of Halton residents and active large community organizations that are learning more each day about the potential plan to use 5,000 acres of farmland to support urban expansion and their voices and concerns need to be heard before any decision is made. In conclusion, Mayor Burton and Oakville councillors, Jane Goodall offers great advice to all of us. She says, you can get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. With that, I conclude my presentation and I thank all of you for your attention to this presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Gray, for the time you took to uh, share your thoughts with us. I do hope that it's our reputation for a friendly welcome that encouraged you to choose us for your apparently first ever delegation to a council. <laughs> um, Thank you. Madam Clerk, uh, would you please call the next delegation? The next delegation is Laura Wabowski.
Ms. Brabowski, uh, welcome as uh, you make the uh, Zoom transition. Uh, as soon as we get there, you are, and you're unmuted, which is a great start, and we can see you. Thanks so much for making the effort to come out tonight, and please begin. Thank you. Yeah, this this is also my first delegation. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so yeah, I'll just I'll jump into it. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Burton, councilors, delegates, and any members of the public who are tuning in. Uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to me today. My name is Lara Robowski, and I've been a resident of Oakville for most of my life. Uh, I'm here today to express my concern about Halton's proposed growth concepts, in particular, the possible expansion of the urban boundary. <laughs> Public speaking, you know. <laughs> uh, many of my most cherished childhood memories involve Halton's outdoors, going on family bike rides through forests, visiting local farms, even looking for tadpoles and ponds and watching them grow into frogs. As I got older, these green spaces continued to play an important role in my development and well-being. Now they serve as an invaluable getaway and restorative space during the pandemic. I always knew Holton was special, but with COVID and having moved away from university, I'm even more appreciative of how incredible our community is. When I heard that Holton was considering expanding its urban boundary, I couldn't just sit back and watch. So much has already been taken away from my generation. We have no idea what our future will look like. And with horrifying predictions from the scientific community, many people my age worry about what's to come instead of look forward to the future. The idea of losing even more green space in Holton makes me feel sick. These spaces are crucial to our well-being. They help make our community special. They allow us to grow local food and they're essential to adapting to climate change. I know I speak on behalf of many when I say that I want a future where younger generations can have the same opportunity as me to explore and fall in love with nature and create their own special memories. I want a future where I can buy local, not only to support the farmers in our community, but to engage in a more sustainable way of living and as a way to help avoid the supply chain issues we've all become so familiar with. I want a future where I don't need a car to drive everywhere, not only because that would help reduce air pollution, but because more walkable communities are more accessible and inclusive. I want a future where I can actually afford to live in Halton. And the best part is, this is all possible. We can do all of this while still accommodating a growing population. We have an incredible opportunity here to steer Halton towards a more sustainable, accessible, and inclusive future. So let's not miss out on that. I urge you to vote in favor of no urban boundary expansion. Thank you again for your time. Thank you very much for your uh, concise remarks. Uh, they are appreciated. And uh, I'm actually heartened to see that uh, uh, Young people are not afraid to come talk to us. I think that's uh, that's kind of a plus. I'm proud of that. So thank you for being awesome. here. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Madam Clerk, would you uh, call the next delegation, please? The next delegation is Crystal Baca. Welcome, Ms. Bika. I'm going to take a chance on that pronunciation. And uh, we can see you. We just need you to unmute so that we can hear you. There you go. You uh, you're very now? welcome. Please begin. And I think you did good. It's Bika. I think you did well. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Just one moment. All right. Good evening. My name is Crystal Bika. I am a resident of Halton. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. This is my first time delegating, uh, but this is a matter that I feel very strongly about, so I'm stepping out of my comfort zone. I'm here because I'm a mother of two young boys, and I'm worried about their future, to the point that it literally keeps me up at night. The evidence of climate change is undeniable. In a short time span, we have witnessed forest fires, drought, flooding, and tornadoes across our country. Windstorms that damage our property are the new normal. We've also experienced weakness in our supply chain when relying on global logistics. At the start of the pandemic, when we had a shortage of PPE, I recall Premier Ford saying that we would make sure we manufacture enough PPE here so that we never need to rely on another country for PPE again. Why don't we have the same mindset when it comes to our food supply? Where will we be in 30 years if we continue down the same path, chasing sprawl and importing more and more of our food? On September 11th, 2019, Halton Regional Council unanimously declared a climate emergency 
Yet today we are discussing whether to pave over an additional 5,000 acres of land. An emergency calls for action. We should be doing everything in our power to cap global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. However, the preferred growth plan has only 45% intensification, while the provincial minimum requirement is 50%. If we are not meeting the minimum requirement, we are not doing everything we can to address climate change, especially when land use planning is the key lever to locking in or locking out greenhouse gas emissions at the municipal level. The decision to pave over thousands of acres of prime farmland is permanent and impacts future generations. I believe that council has an ethical obligation to ensure that the decisions you make today do not put your community at risk in the future. We can't ignore the knowledge that we have about climate change, how to build sustainable communities, and how agriculture can actually be used to help mitigate the climate crisis, while also being a multi-billion dollar industry that employs thousands. We can keep the existing urban boundary, keep our farms for food security, and accommodate the same mix of housing as long as we use land efficiently. As a mom, I am much more worried about my children and grandchildren having access to the basic necessities of life, such as food and shelter, than I am about receiving an online order the next day. So please don't trade our farms for warehouses. We must take a step back and acknowledge that we need to make changes. Some of our habits, are simply not sustainable and we must reconsider our priorities. We cannot take a not in my backyard approach to a global issue. This is everyone's issue. We have an opportunity to develop differently and to plan ahead, which is much more effective than trying to add services such as public transit afterwards if the population density does not exist. Municipalities across the country, including Mississauga and Edmonton, are starting to understand and warn against the cost of sprawl. Sprawl is not financially or environmentally sustainable due to the extra infrastructure required. Cars and trucks also contribute a significant amount to our carbon footprint. More sprawl will only contribute further to greenhouse gas emissions. Realistically, it may be many years before electric cars replace combustion engines for the average person, and that may not be soon enough. Car dependency is not the best option, nor is it healthy. My education is in kinesiology and health promotion. I find the report from Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Teresa Tam, very relevant. In the 1940s, the split between urban rural living was about 50-50. Now, about 80% of Canadians live in an urban or suburban area. Our communities are changing and often expanding through sprawl, rather than by building compact and complete communities. Sprawl has been linked to sedentary lifestyles, easy access to unhealthy food, less physical activity, and higher rates of obesity, all of which lead to chronic health conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, and also take a toll on our mental health. One of the key results of sprawl that may explain some of these impacts is more time spent driving. From 1999 to 2016, the number of registered light motor vehicles, including cars and SUVs in Canada, has increased at a faster rate than Canada's population, at 36% compared to 19%. This suggests that Canadians are increasingly relying on driving. Um, and it just so happened that I actually also have an article here from the Walrus that says, um, condenser would be better. As it turns out, having more neighbors may actually help you live better. It's better access to services, better health outcomes, better housing affordability, and more environmentally sustainable. We can address the climate crisis and reduce strain on the healthcare system by putting an end to sprawl. We have learned from mistakes over the past 70 years. We don't need to keep making them for the next 30. The leaders in this room have the opportunity to design brand new, healthy, and financially and environmentally sustainable communities and to set the tone in order for the climate crisis to be taken seriously. This can be done within the thousands of acres that are already designated for development. Please think ahead beyond 30 years for all of our children and grandchildren. Our agricultural land is an asset to our community. Please preserve it and say no to any urban boundary expansion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bika, for your efforts on our behalf. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to visit with us. Um, Madam Clerk, would you call the next delegation? Next delegation is Chris Hitchcock.
And there I am as myself. Well, welcome. can you hear me? We can see you well and hear you. Please begin. Okay, actually, could you turn the slides off? I'll, I'll let you know when I want them. Thank you. So good evening, Mayor Burton, Oakville councillors and concerned citizens who I know are listening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you, uh, to address you today on this important issue. I'm a resident of Ward 6. I moved to Oakville in 2012. I'd like to use my time to talk about legacy. And I know others have touched on it. Uh, like many in Oakville, I have grown increasingly concerned about the changes in climate. I've looked back at how things have changed during my lifetime. I think about children and their children and all the people who will be living here long after we are gone. Honestly, it's hard to feel proud of the climate legacy we are leaving behind us. I've, um, in the last three years, I've trained as an En-ROADS climate ambassador so that I can give workshops on climate. I've joined GASP and other organizations and I'm doing what I can to make things better. Um, land use decisions are made decades in advance of shovels hitting the ground, and those effects persist for decades. Land use decisions are also among the most powerful tools that local governments have to address climate change. Could I have the slides, please? So what I'd like to talk to you about today is that you have the opportunity to leave a climate legacy. Could I have the next slide? Some background. Um, global temperatures have been rising. In 1990, countries gathered internationally to pledge changes that might stop this. But if you look at the graph since 1990, Temperatures have been rising even more steeply. This graph actually ends in the early 20 teens and it's been going up further. Next slide. This is a graph of emissions. Again, the graph starts in 1990 when we decided we were gonna do something about this. The black line is what's happened historically in terms of global greenhouse emissions per year. We're increasing and increasing and increasing. Where the line changes to colors and the possible futures, that's where we are. And we have choices about where we go. Um, the policies and actions that people are proposing are going to take us to 2.5 to 2.9 degrees Celsius increases. And we're already seeing effects at 1.5. So this is the context in which you're making decisions. So you can say, okay, fine, these are global statistics. What does this really have to do with me as a regional person? Well, for one thing, local governments are the ones who have to deal with the impact of extreme weather events. Next slide. This is a graph that goes from 1980 to 2019. And what it shows is that the number of extreme weather events is becoming more frequent across the globe. You probably see it in the news, but it does seem to be something you can, you can see. And there's some sign that it may be accelerating. Uh, next slide, please. So some examples from Canada. On the West Coast last year, Vancouverites faced an unprecedented heat, heat dome with hundreds of lives lost. We saw wildfires. And this fall, the normally heavy November rains turned torrential. They coined new phrases like atmospheric rivers. The damages from the flooding and the landslides will take a lot of time and money to repair and some communities may never be rebuilt. Closer to home, Burlington flooding in 2014 caused an estimated $90 million in damages. 
These things are concerning, and it's good that Canada is at the table in climate negotiations, right? Let's have a look. Next slide. This is a graph of the G7 countries. Since 1990 to 2019, what you can see is that almost every country has brought their emissions down below where they were in 1990, except Canada. It's embarrassing. We really need to improve. So looking at this, I ask myself, what can we do? Many of the changes I personally can make are pretty minor. I can recycle, I can turn my heat back, I can have compost in my yard, maybe buy an electric vehicle. But unlike me, unlike the average concerned citizen, you councillors are in a position to make a significant difference. Next slide, please. The majority of greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation and buildings. Which brings me back to you, councillors. If you could turn off the slides, please. Climate change is complicated and responding to it is going to take many forms. But one of the most powerful changes is in your power. Land use decisions make a huge difference in how people in the future will live. And these decisions last a long time perhaps 80 years. In the case of farmland, it's permanent. Once it's gone, we can't get it back. You're being asked to make decisions about land use out to 2051. Those decisions will be felt by people in 2131. None of us will be alive then. And most of those people have yet to be born. The decisions about land use will live long after you. Choose well, you have the opportunity to leave a legacy. Thank you. Thank you very much for the time you took to share those thoughts with us and compose them. Um, Madam Clerk, would you call the uh, next delegation, please? The next delegation is Sunald Puri. Hello, everyone. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Hello, sir. We hear you, and it looks like we're about to see you. We can see you now very well. Please begin. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Mayor and Councillors, for uh, uh, taking the time to listen to all of the delegations. Uh, my name is Sunil, and I'm here on behalf of the National Farmers Union Local Chapter 351, which represents Hamilton, Brant, and Halton. Uh, the NFU is an accredited farm organization uh, representing thousands of sustainable family farmers in Ontario um, and has ad advocated for farm families across Ontario and Canada since 1969. Uh, most of the points that our delegation wanted to bring up have already been spoken to. Uh, so uh, I won't touch on those just in the interest of time. The one point that we did want to bring up is uh, that the Greater Golden Horseshoe area here is home to one of North America's largest agricultural and agri-food industry clusters uh, with a unique diversity of primary farm production, food processing, food service, food distribution, and retail uh, that actually represents the fastest growing employment sector in Ontario. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that the staff uh, was aware of that in writing their critique and sending that on to the uh, February 9th meeting um, and that the councillors were aware in making their vote. Uh, I, everything else that our delegation wanted to speak to has already been brought up. So in the interest of time, I, I won't rehash that. Uh, thank you all so much for the time and for hearing us all out. Thank you very much. You are a model delegate uh, of being so considerate of everybody. So thank you for that. <laughs> of course, of course. Madam Clerk, would you call the next delegation, please? Our last delegation is Phil Poffin.
The clerk says that she doesn't see him. I don't either on my little uh, control panel. So, Council, I think we are at uh, the point where we can confine this to table. And uh, it's, it's your decision now. Councillor Adams. I think you already have uh, the motion on the floor. I just wanted to, it's been a very long evening already. I want to first of all, thank all of the delegations. I also wanted to thank the close to a thousand emails um, and senders of emails that I've received on this issue uh, over the last few, few days or perhaps week or so. Um, the numerous phone calls I've had, um, the issues that are noted in our staff report, I think are real. And I fully support those criticisms and concerns that have been brought forward. Uh, and I look forward to passing this motion this evening. Uh, I wondered if we could have a recorded vote on this issue, please. He is here now. Oh, um, Council, um, Mr. Pothan has reappeared. If you'd like to uh, entertain his submissions, he's with Environmental Defense Canada and uh, uh, I, I'm acquainted with the gentleman. I, uh, I would be happy to have him add his uh, comments. Uh, Your Worship, I look forward to reopening it so that we can hear from him. I'm, I'm sorry, just say that again, please. I look forward to uh, returning it back to the tables uh, so that uh, we can hear from the delegate. All right, well, thank you very much then. Uh, and. And good of you to come out, and perhaps you'll be interested to watch the rest of the meeting then. All right, Council, um, uh, uh, you can put your hands back up. Uh, Councillor Adams is finished, as I understand it. Uh, a recorded vote is available on request by anyone. Councillor O'Meara. Thank you, Worship, and thank you to the delegates again who came out and spoke. Um, it's, it's clear there's a lot of passion about uh, about this issue, and and I, I I do agree. It's very hard to be sitting here thinking about how we're going to plan for 2051 when you know from one provincial cycle to the next we don't know what's ahead of us, let alone 20 years from now. It's a it's a tough one to swallow. But I guess my question would be: I have a couple of questions for staff. Um, and I believe um, Rob uh, had mentioned it in in one of the first presentations, just about what what are the what's the what does the province say we need to do in terms of um, mixed housing in in the region and and what is the province what is the province telling us we must include in the regional uh, uh, plan and and would our decision to not extend the urban boundary align with the province's directives on what they are requiring us to do. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Councillor Romero. The, so the, the, um, the growth plan prescribes a method for calculating housing supply. It's called the land needs assessment, and that's, that's detailed a little bit in the report. But essentially, um, it's a way of taking demographic information and growth of population information and turning that into a demand for housing and then assessing what demand is uh, or what supply is available within designated areas already. And if there is insufficient land or designations to support that uh, predicted demand, so if the supply is under the demand, then that's where the LNA, the land needs assessment, would direct you to expansions and new greenfield areas. So that is the exercise that the, the region has undertaken, uh, and that's where we've arrived at with, um, with this work. So we're not... We're not going awry of provincial directions should we should we wish to keep the urban boundary as it is right now we would not be be uh, out of step with what the province has told us we need to do uh so through you mr chair just to understand your question councillor if we do not expand the urban boundary we'd be out of step with the provincial requirements or the preferred growth concept would be uh, if, if we choose a if, if we choose a preferred growth concept that does not expand the urban boundary, it, will that be uh, it, that's not out of step with what the province has has asked us to come back with? Let uh, me excuse me. Sure. Let me 
uh, bring some clarity. I, I, I think I can help. We don't have a choice in front of us at the region. The region is, is proposing one and one only growth concept. And on February 9th, um, uh, we will have to inquire, I mean, the regional council will have to make a decision as to what it wants to do. And it will have to uh, direct regional staff in whatever way it chooses, should it choose not to adopt the preferred growth plan. Um, does that help you? Yeah, uh, it, it, it does. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm worried about making a decision and having the province come back and say, we don't like your decision. We're going to make the decision for you. And it ends up being worse than what the decision is. So I'm, I'm just trying to get some clarification from okay. staff on whether that's a possibility or not. <laughs> that, so we're not making that decision tonight. Okay. Right. And so, and your question is really in order for the regional council meeting on or, be, uh, or regional staff before, you know, on February 9th or of regional staff before February 9th. But our decision tonight is only to uh, forward our criticisms of the preferred growth concept. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Your Worship. You're welcome. Councillor Duddick is next. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm in full support of what's being proposed, and I appreciate the fact that um, the second item on the motion uh, provides some clarity in regards to what our town staff provided for it. I regarded it, the majority of it, um, raising serious concerns with what is being proposed through the uh, um, preferred uh, growth and consequently um, the fact that we're not endorsing a report but rather endorsing the uh, criticisms that we have or the concerns rather that we have with the, uh, the current uh, proposal, I'm comfortable with that. Thank you, Councillor Dunnick. Um, Councillor Amira has his hand up, but we our rules will come to you for a second time, uh, Councillor Amira, or else it was an error. Thank you. Councillor Elgar is next. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mayor Burton, I just want to uh, thank staff for the report. Actually, I thought one of the better reports I read, it, it was only, it, it, it kind of went sideways when all of a sudden they, they saw how bad it was, but maybe, you know, we're trying to get along as buddies. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, I just hope everybody can really endorse um, and vote for this report, especially item two, where we endorse the criticisms. And staff brought all the criticisms out. Um, when you look at the land's need assessment, if you've read the tables, the tables on housing mix were 20, 2011 to 2021, we're sitting at 38.5% only of single and, and semis. Whereas if the, and the, what they, they did in the other part, they're saying, well, we have to look back 50 years. So therefore we're going at 50% uh, with housing prices that we see now. And we're going to see young people, I think they're, they're seeing a change in things and they see it differently than, than we did. I guess maybe we're just getting old, but uh, I really hope all of council will, uh, will support the motion before us tonight. And I thank uh, Councillor Adams for saying a recorded vote. I think that's a great idea and we'll send a strong message to the region as we go forward and it should be fun on February the 9th. I thank you. And really the delegations that come out tonight, fantastic things they brought up. Hats off to everybody that took the time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Elgar. And I, I'd like to second your remark that everyone should read the draft land needs assessment report by the region. It's a long, complicated document, but as you illustrated with your, um, your, you know, the table you mentioned, it's not that hard and it's worth reading. Uh, reminds me of my grade 10 algebra teacher made us show our work and the, and that's where you find mistakes, right? And the land needs assessment report pretty much shows how it calculates its number. So everybody should, I mean, really, I think you should read that. Uh, thank you, for uh, Council, for letting me interrupt you with my little sermon about reading reports. 
Uh, Councillor Robertson, you're next. Hello, I feel very strongly about this tonight. Um, I grew up on a farm and I understand the value of agriculture. I heard from farm owners from Halton today who said, but we'll never be able to sell our farm because no farmer will be able to purchase it at what a developer would purchase it for. And I disagree with the fact that farming is, or family farming, local farming is a non-entity anymore. I think that more people will embrace trying to get into it to provide local food sources. So I would give the, the opinion that you don't give up on farming. And, um, and if you don't want your own farm, you figure a way to sell it to another farmer. And, um, and even if that farmer is a large farmer who rents out his farms, that's fine too. In terms of the other aspect of us building up within Oakville, I think that zoning is important. We, the mayor was right, we can have secondary suites, but can we have secondary suites in single dwelling neighborhoods? Because that, if we can't, that then becomes the limit that we need to work on next. We have to be creative. We have to find new ways to put more population in and allow people to have a place to live. I liked the, um, the delegate who talked about the fact that, you know, if I had, there are so many implications of having a small dwelling on some of our bigger lots and um, for rent purposes, to allow a senior to stay at home and stay in place or to allow a senior to live in their backyard in a smaller home and have their family in the main house. So there are things that we do have to look, look after after this meeting. And, um, and I hope that we have the capacity to be creative and everyone that wrote in has the capacity to wanna see that change then within their neighborhoods. I'm not talking mass scale changes. I'm not talking low rises in residential, but I am talking about the ability to be able to be creative and allow for more living on our property, especially our large lots. I think that had Councillor Elgar not made this motion, mine would have been such a quick no to the original motion. I do endorse all the criticisms. Um, I wish they, and, I, and, and like the uh, one participant said, delegate said, I wish that we could take them out and make them their own separate document because I want the public to know that in no way do I endorse the acceptance of the region's proposal. I, I don't endorse the staff saying, we support it, but we have all these reservations. Because honestly, I don't think our staff does support it. And I want that to be clear is that my, my view and my vote today will reflect the fact that I don't support what the region has brought forward. I don't get a vote as a regional councillor. I'm a town councillor, but I would like it to be on the record tonight of people knowing that I, I really, really believe in our sense of climate change mitigation, our sense of agriculture and putting food first, and that we can do it within our existing urban boundaries. So thank you. And um, I will support the motion of endorsing the criticisms. Thank you, Councillor Robertson. Councillor Giddings. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as everyone else has mentioned, it's always good to hear from our residents and my goodness have we heard from them uh, through phone calls and emails and, and walking the dog. Um, question in terms of uh, a lot of the feedback we've been getting, a lot of the emails said, just say no, just stop growing. Now, Mr. Bigger, could you comment on that in terms of uh, are we able to say no to the province? You know, will uh, 
Milton and Halton Hills stopped be, be able to stop the 190,000 people that was scheduled to arrive or planned for between 2031 and 2051. I just want to make the people uh, aware that are watching this evening uh, how the system works. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, to the councillor, uh, it's, it's difficult to say no. Uh, it's a requirement of the growth plan and a requirement of the provincial plan to accommodate growth over a certain period of time. I think what we're trying to focus on is how we're going to accommodate that growth. So it's going to come, and we've reported on this in the past. It, it can come to Oakville. It can come to other parts of the GTA, and those effects will be direct or indirect. What we're, what we're supportive of is growth in Oakville to build those complete communities and those transit supportive densities and, and all the benefits that go along with that, including addressing uh, the climate challenges before us. Uh, so it's, it's more about shaping the growth that we know is coming because this is a great place to live in this part of the world. Um, we can't say no to it coming. Uh, so it's shaping it. All right, I appreciate that. And so if the 5,000 acres, um, isn't approved in terms of uh, in terms of greenfield, it will result in what many people are asking for in terms of whether it be increased density and missing middle or whatever uh, they've mentioned and high rise or, or condos uh, to be able to get them to fit in the communities. That would be a yes, councillor. That's correct. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Giddings. Councillor hazlitt -Teal. Uh Thank you, Mayor Burton. Um, what a night. Um, I, I'm uh, incredibly appreciative to all of the residents that have come and spoken. Um, beyond passionate and insightful, it just shows us that we live in a community that truly cares about the future. Um, I'm very supportive of the uh, change to item two uh, um, and that we've called out that these criticisms need to be uh, uh, highlighted and reviewed. Um, I was actually quite shocked when I read the land use assessment um, mm -hmm. and all those tables. Um, and it was beyond unsettling that the diversity of mix that is that has driven the ultimate preferred option um, is counter the past 10 years and to a clear trend. Um, and it doesn't acknowledge that built form is evolving today um, and has in the past few years uh, around climate change and affordability. So I applaud the staff for calling out the need to revisit uh, the LNA. I'm also concerned um, about the other criticism that was in it that uh, highlights that there's fundamental policies that would, as one of the delegates said quite uh, clearly, should have been there at the top of the list to be uh, factored <laughs> in before you make a decision. Um, so again, thank you for calling that out. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the fact that the 2021 census comes out this summer, and yet um, we're not going to have that information and you're not gonna have that information uh, factored into those decisions. Um, most businesses have realized quite some time ago that, you know, yes, they have to do a strategic plan and they have to have the foresight and the best information to make uh, a strategic plan and they have to identify trends. But they also recognize that the pace of change is so significant today that they have to have flexibility to reassess the economic the social and the environmental factors that drive their, their strategic plan. And that is really what land use planning needs to consider. And as other people have said tonight, this is an irreversible decision. As the young people would say, there are no take backs. This is, this is it, this will be over and it will be gone. So I get that we are, as some people phrase, a servant of the province. I really hate that phrase, but I guess that we are instructed by what we must do. But I think that we can't be backed into a corner. We have to have the fortitude to stand up and say, there are fundamental flaws in some of this analysis. Please take a closer look. 
please take the time to be a steward of, uh, of the environment, to, of considering the social impact, considering the economic impact. It's, it's not just one, it's all three. I want to also acknowledge that the regional councillors have a tough job. Um, and I know that this is a decision that weighs heavily on you. And as a town councillor, all I can do is provide you with my input, um, my residents' input, and have trust that you, you do think deeply about these issues um, and will uh, ask and, and encourage greater diligence to find better solutions because frankly, the next generation is counting on you. So I will be supporting Councillor Elger's motion. Thank you, Councillor Hazlitt Thiel. Councillor Longo. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, I want to thank you. Oh, can you hear me? Hello? I'm good. Uh, I just want to thank all the delegates for for their passionate, uh, you know, uh, the 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 words that they spoke and, and the passion that they showed. I also want to thank uh, Councillor Elger for the revised uh, motion. I fully support it. Uh, I think the criticism from uh, the the town of Oakville staff uh, is really important and and needs to be noted and and brought forward to Halton. Um, the uh, you know I think. I think COVID has really shown us the importance of, of food security, uh, as well as security of, of everything else that we have to you know, rely on as a, as a society. And so we need to protect our farmland. We need to protect our farmland for climate resiliency, for our food security, uh, and, and you know, farms feed uh, cities and towns. And I think we need to never lose sight of that. And I think, uh, you know, I'm not on regional council, I, I want to, give my support to those regional councillors who are here tonight, as uh, uh, Councillor Hassel had, has mentioned, that I uh, fully support, uh, you know, what you have to go forward with and vote on. But I think keeping the urban boundaries, keeping farmland, protecting it, and not expanding the urban boundaries into the farmland is, is very, very important. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. So we need to protect it. So I will be fully supporting this motion. Thank you, Councillor Longo. Um, Councillor Liz Chenna, and then Councillor Knoll. Thank you, Your Worship. I, uh, I will be supporting uh, Councillor Alger's motion, but I do want to make a note that um, we really need to, I, I don't even know what the saying is, talk the walk or walk the talk, because pretty much every planning and development council meeting I've attended, um, any of the growth nodes, when we talk about height of buildings, uh, councillors take offense to those heights. Um, they, they do have residents who tell them that they, have, they don't like those heights, including today. Um, so I think we really have to be careful when, when we say, you know, we've got to intensify because we need to walk the talk. As, as everybody's talking here, how they're supporting this motion, but the next time in your ward, a tall building's coming with extra, you know, extra height that you don't take offense to it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Lischina. Um, Councillor Knoll. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I don't have a lot to offer. I'm trying to uh, uh, keep my um, decision clean so that uh, I can properly listen to and deliberate at uh, regional council. I'm one of the seven of us that gets to make this ultimate decision, but I do want to say thank you to uh, all the delegates as well, uh, but particularly thank you to the re local councillors um, for expressing your opinions and providing us with that guidance. Uh, it is helpful to inform uh, the decision that we get to make, which as we all know is an incredibly important one. Um, I do want to emphasize uh, and reiterate what Councillor Chenna said. Uh, it was something that uh, uh, has been going through my mind throughout this entire process as well. Is it's 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 always interesting, um, you know, in 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 this in this world of municipal politics, where so, you're darned if you do and you're darned if you don't sometimes, because um, you know you're in a situation where uh, uh, you know there's there's a big out outcry about you know don't don't build more ground level uh, uh, you know development 
build high rises, intensify. And then when you do intensify, as Councillor Lachina said, you get folks coming out and saying, oh no, it's, it's inhumane, it's too tall, it's blocking the light. So you have this really careful balancing act. And, and this is something that certainly uh, we have to take into serious consideration as we uh, have to protect uh, our goal of making or maintaining Oakville to be the best community to live in in Canada. Um, and that's certainly something that, uh, you know, those of us that, that are, are being called to make this decision, we have to take into take all those factors into consideration. So coming back to what I started with, thank you so much for um, your comments. Uh, thank you to Councillor Elgar for the, the motion tonight. I will be supporting it. Um, and uh, thank you particularly to the staff for writing a, a, a very good report. It was, uh, I found it uh, very easy to understand their point of view and the perspective. Um, I think the regional materials have been excellent as well, frankly, but I think the town really, the town staff really did a great job of, of delineating and synthesizing a lot of information to make it uh, understandable from not just the Oakville context, but from the overall context, the overall planning context. So my hat's off to uh, the entire team at, uh, at planning. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, all I can say to our, our local colleagues and to uh, the community at large, stay tuned. It's only a few weeks left to go before uh, we get that fateful, fateful vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Noel. Councillor Chisholm. Thank you, Worship. I even supported the uh, the motion uh, provided by uh, Councillor Elgar and uh, understanding what I've heard tonight, the passion and the understanding of the issues of the day. I think we're at a, a point in, in our, our proceedings is, is almost a paradigm shift in our mindsets and how we deal with uh, land use policies and how we move forward. And it's always looking, as, as Councillor Noll indicated, to, you know, between intensification, intensification and urban sprawl is where that balance, where that balance um, is, is, um, happens. So at the end of the day, yes, I agree with Councillor Lashina when she says, you know, about tall buildings and so forth, there's a give and take. Um, I am a firm believer that we can no longer keep expanding and losing farmland or natural heritage areas uh, in, in the GTA uh, area, and, and it's very concerning, especially when I have grandchildren and they ask me the question why we're building all these things. Uh, and, you know, you try to explain to them, you know, with growth and so forth. But at the end of the day, listening to the younger um, deputations and, and presentation today of the younger people, the passion and the strength and their conviction is a good thing that we have that. We need to start changing our ways of how we design and so forth in the, I guess, the existing documents that we have. We have to be more creative in the future. So I'm looking forward to... Uh, um, uh, endorsing this uh, this uh, motion that Councillor Elgar has put forward, I know my council colleagues are going to have a uh, you know a real heart wrenching uh, meeting in a couple of weeks uh, for decision with respect to this. Not just not just for Oakville uh, councillors, but also the Halton uh, Halton Hills and um, uh, Milton and, and Burlington. So I'm hoping everybody's on the same um, mindset. And uh, I look forward to that meeting coming forward. And again, my congratulations to the staff on a very comprehensive and clarity uh, of the issues. And to say that we're criticizing, yes, I think it's more of the position of Oakville. And I think we have the backing and support of our residents. It's clearly indicated everyone and all the phone calls and everything that we've um, had in the last two weeks, you can see that it's a groundswell and there's a change of mindsets. And, and where we're going to be going in the future. So we need to start thinking in that manner. And uh, I leave that uh, as is. And uh, again, thanks for uh, all the deputations and presentations tonight. It was well thought out and well organized. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Chisholm. I think that's all of us except me uh, have uh, spoken. And uh, I do have a few words I want to share. Um, and they're not, they're not many, it's not long. Uh, First off, I, I want to thank uh, Councillor Elgar for agreeing to put forward the motion that, that I wrote and um, sent to him. I wanted to honor him as uh, what I think of as the Green Dean of Council. Uh, Councillor Knoll and Councillor Elgar both started back in the year 2000, as I recall. And uh, 
and Alan has been a steadfast uh, Mr. Green Jeans, if I can. He has a farming background. I hope he will like that. As, you know, I hope you won't regard that as a negative aspersion. So anyway, I want to just clear that up. Um, and then secondly, it's important to me as a sworn official that we, we pass laws and we expect people to obey the laws we pass. And the province passes laws. And, and I believe that ethically, if I'm going to pass laws, if we're going to pass laws and, and expect people to obey them and enforce them, then we have to keep our eye on the province's laws and respect and obey them. And so uh, I want to take a minute to talk about are we, are we embarking on a path, we eight who represent Oakville at the Halton region, would we be breaking the law if we didn't uh, support the draft preferred growth concept? And my answer is no, we wouldn't be. My belief is that the land needs assessment that has been offered by the region does not itself follow the law. The laws, uh, and our staff have done a terrific job of pointing out the, the way that the land needs assessment does not conform to the growth plan and, and the rest of the laws that the province has imposed on this. And so I think that's, that's an important point. And the second point uh, uh, that troubles me about the draft preferred growth concept is, as I understand it from information provided to me by regional staff, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the density for the new uh, designated greenfield area, that's the expansion area, is lower than it is in the, uh, uh, than it ought to be. Uh, let me put it that way. And uh, the, the existing designated greenfield area, and I know this gets confusing when you have new designated greenfield area and we have this old designated greenfield area, but Milton has an old designated greenfield area across the south of Milton, and we have one across the north of Oakville. And for that matter, Halton Hills has a existing uh, uh, DGA uh, from the 2009 uh, Sustainable Halton exercise. And, and it, it struck me as an odd thing that the new uh, designated greenfield, uh, greenfield area would be at a lower density than the old ones. I, I thought that that troubled me. So I'm just laying that marker out there for our, our neighbors in the rest of Halton who I know are watching and, and wondering what we're up to here. The, second, uh, the next thing I want to say, and I guess this is probably the third thing, is uh, I've spent two years publicizing this. Uh, we've had planning staff from the region and the town um, several times in front of our community leaders roundtable. This town is blessed with many community groups and the leaders of all of them are welcome every month to this ad hoc thing we created during the power plant battle that carries on every the end of every month. And, uh, and over the last two years, many times they have received uh, presentations from uh, our planning staff and the region's planning staff who are also our planning staff. And, uh, and I also devoted a lot of effort with the nightly newsletter from the Office of Mayor and Council to this topic. I put out information. I got letters and emails from people saying, you're putting out contradictory information. There's pro-sprawl and anti-sprawl. And I said to one person who asked me that, I said, as mayor, I have to read all kinds of points of view in order to try to sift through it and arrive at a good decision for our town. And I was sharing with you the privilege of being able to look at and consider many different points of view, some of them contradictory. Um, and in all of that effort, we have, it has, you know, I, I believe that this is incredibly well publicized. I know that the, the participation, the public participation with the region 
in numbers has been greater than it used to be when we did in person. And, and all of you who've been to those, remember those were pretty small gatherings of people and the electronic means has actually multiplied our ability to reach people. And in all of that, have any of you received any emails or letters or phone calls in support of the draft preferred growth concept? I have not. So uh, it makes me believe that our delegations tonight may be in fact fairly representative of our community. And, and I, I think that's a good thing. Uh, now I, I, wanna, I wanna also touch on the four growth concepts that were prepared by the region. There originally were four. Uh, there was no growth concept that had no expansion. Uh, concept number three had the least expansion. It really only had expansion of employment up Trafalgar and Milton to help support Metrolinx's plan to create a go station at that they're calling Agerton. And, uh, and so early last year, I, uh, I floated a motion supported by Halton Hills Councilor Jane Fogel asking the region staff to produce a, a, an actual no expansion concept. Now it took three months to get that through council. And I think that's worth paying some attention to. The original proposal that we submitted was to create the no sprawl option and to develop a farm belt, a farm protection belt for the farmland. And our first presentation of it was greeted with a motion to defer, which is one of the ways that parliamentary bodies sometimes use to kill things. And uh, so anyway, it was deferred. And in the, sub, in, the, in the ensuing conversations that took place, we discovered that the farm belt piece was like a poison pill that was not gonna get majority support. And because we wanted a no sprawl option, we reluctantly removed the, uh, the farm belt option from our motion. And then eventually the, uh, the no sprawl option had enough support on regional council to be passed and the staff proceeded to uh, solicit public input on that. But the footnote, and I tell this story at this length because there's a very important footnote here that we need to remember. At no time was there any evidence to support the, no, the absolutely pure no sprawl option. There was no draft land needs assessment that showed it was possible. There was assurance from the staff at the region back then that, that what became known as 3A, the original three with only the employment expansion up Trafalgar, that that was viable and, uh, and uh, could be done within the methodology of a land needs assessment. Now, lo and behold, later on, uh, notwithstanding the fact that about, you know, a clear majority of the public consulted preferred the no sprawl option, uh, we got a new land, we got a land needs assessment uh, draft report in November that said, well, actually, no, you have to do this. And Councillor Elgar has already pointed out the technique that was used, which is the 50 years versus the uh, 10 years. And I think that's clear. And I think it's important that we all understand that. And so I hope you'll forgive me for laboring this point. Um, and then finally, I wanna say a quick word about Sustainable Halton. Sustainable Halton was uh, started out to be durable Halton. And it started, the work on that started before I ever got elected. And when I got elected as mayor, I became a regional counselor. And at one of my very first meetings in 2007, I learned that the, the future growth plan for Halton 12, you know, that was gonna be passed and did get passed in 2009, 12 years ago, 
I learned that it was going to be called Durable Halton. And it reminded me of Tupperware. And anyway, I believe that plans ought to be visionary and they ought to be inspiring. And I didn't find durable an inspiring word. word. I, I moved a motion that a majority of council uh, agreed to, to change the name to Sustainable Halton because I wanted it to be the star on the horizon that we drive towards or steer towards. Staff ignored the vote and kept calling it Durable Halton. At a subsequent council meeting several months later, I asked, uh, how many times do we have to vote on this before you actually change the name? And I learned at that meeting that we had to vote on it again. So I moved it again and it passed again. And the footnote I'll make is neither time was it unanimous. We, we have learned at the Halton Council to respectfully disagree with each other or to disagree with each other when we disagree respectfully. And, uh, uh, and I think that's also a really important point because we are friends and neighbors in Halton and uh, it doesn't do to, you know, be gratuitously offensive. Um, so I still believe that Sustainable Halton is what the region's official plan should be called. And I still believe that because I think it should be, that is the inspiration that we're chasing here. And uh, I still believe that we'll get there. And, uh, uh, as for climate change, uh, my, my only comment on that is one of our delegations tonight showed that the matter, the, the biggest drivers that we ourselves can deal with is our homes and our cars. And if we're, if we're heating with gas instead of an air heat pump, and if we're driving a gasoline car instead of an electric car, we're avoiding the biggest single change we can make to affect climate change. And uh, that's, that I think is uh, something that we need to keep in mind as we continue to work on our climate change plan here at the town. So I will support the motion, obviously. And, uh, and I will call on our colleagues at the region to at least respect the flaws, uh, respect the need to work on the flaws in the land needs assessment and, uh, and to save the farmland. So uh, with that, uh, I will first ask if there's any opposition to the motion, although you all said you were in favor of it, but I like to be a proper and correct chair and I see none. And so uh, it's your choice. We can have the clerk record our names as, as is, is, that's the result of a recorded vote. Or we can have a, a roll call vote to boot. What's your pleasure, Council? Don't all speak at once. Councillor Adams. I'm happy to have the clerk uh, record all of our names in a unanimous way. All right. Is there any disagreement with that? There being none, Madam Clerk, would you please uh, record the unanimous uh, support of Council for the uh, substitute recommendation moved by Councillor Elgar. All right. Uh, if I'm right about where we are, I took a lot of notes on my agenda, and so I sometimes worry that I'm going to miss the next item. But I think we're at item 10 now. And, uh, and that means we could use a motion to rise and report. Councillor Longo, first out of the gate. Thank you very much. Is there any objection to Councillor Longo's motion? Madam Clerk, there being none, that carries. I rise and report the Committee of the Whole has met and has made recommendations on consent items 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, public hearing items 6.1, discussion items 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3, and advisory committee minutes item 9.1, as noted by the clerk. May I have a mover and seconder for my report? Councillor Lischina and uh, Councillor Giddings, thank you. Is there any objection to the report or the motion for the report? Madam Clerk, there being none, the, the report is adopted. 
Um, is there any new business that anyone would like to bring forward at this time? Seeing none, uh, Councillor O'Meara, thank you. Sorry, Your Worship, this is also the time for condolence, is that, is that correct? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Sorry, the, it, is this also the time to offer our condolences? Oh, any form of new business, including condolences, okay. is in order. I, thank you. I, I, I did just want to extend for some of our regional council colleagues um, uh, the passing of Sterling Todd, who uh, worked at the uh, region in the uh, regional waterfront uh, uh, water park. Uh, sorry, waterfront parks area um, for a while, and, and ended up at uh, at Milton. He passed away um, earlier this week, and and it was a, a bit of a shock, but. Uh, I, I had the pleasure of working with Sterling on the Burl Oak Waterfront Park and, and even on, uh, on uh, um, some of the, the Spencer Smith Park as I chaired the advisory committee on, on the region's waterfront parks. And uh, I know he worked very closely with our, our parks and rec staff and with uh, Director Mark and, and a lot of our, our uh, waterfront uh, staff as well. And he was always a gentleman to work with. So I just wanted to extend uh, my condolences to the town of Milton and to his family, to everybody uh, who will miss him. So thank you very much for that, Your Worship. Councillor O'Meara, thank you very much for doing that on behalf of all of us. Councillor Duddock. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'd like to extend uh, my condolences and I dare say the rest of council will join with me. Um, the recent passing of Janet Mitchell. Um, she was a regional and town council for uh, Town of Oakville and Region of Halton. She was very active in our community, always a straight shooter, and she will be missed. And all our best to Bob and the uh, rest of the family. Thank you very much, Councillor Duddick, for bringing that forward on behalf of all of us, because we join you in uh, the condolences. Um, there being no other new business, I would ask for a mover and seconder for the uh, consideration and reading of the bylaws. Councillor Chisholm, Councillor Grant, thank you very much. Is there any objection? Madam Clerk, there being no objection shown, the bylaws are considered read and passed as listed in the agenda. And that completes our work. And uh, I thank everybody for the time and attention that you gave to this and all of the reports that you read to prepare for it. And uh, it's been terrific working with you. And uh, that is the end of the meeting.